Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, August 19th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live. Steps and steps and steps from the Industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Ben Wickler, chairman of the Wisconsin Democratic Party, will join us. Also on the program, night two, the DNC brings Iraq war perpetrator platforming, fossil fuel defunding dropping, AOC smearing in a genuinely nice expression of the diversity of the Democratic Party and the American people. Eh, mixed bag. Meanwhile, Mitch McConnell prepares to lowball on the coronavirus relief package. And the Republican chaired, Republican chaired Senate Intel report goes even further than the Mueller report and confirms much of Russiagate. Russiagate 1.0? Russiagate 1.0. Under pressure, Louis DeJoy backs off postal cuts, but mail-in voting obstacles remain, ladies and gentlemen. Clint appointed federal judge blocks Trump's attempt to end transgender health care protections. Portsmouth, Virginia police want to do an end run around the prosecutor to charge with felonies people who were involved in the protests against Confederate statues. Laura Loomer wins her GOP primary and a congressional QAnon will be Wants Talib and Omar to adopt the Christian Bible. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna. Uh, our guest will join us in a, a little bit later. Uh, we're we're mixing up the uh, format today. Not not significantly, but a little bit. Um, we will probably take your calls uh, later in the uh, program as uh, per normal and um oh, there we go uh just also wanted you to uh, to know uh tomorrow will be a, uh, a a typical thursday that we've been doing over the course of this month we will be playing a, a best of interview by uh michael brooks uh from this uh, program uh and uh then uh jamie and matt and matt and Brendan will be um, will be will be here with you on Friday. Oh, on Friday, my microphone has a life of its own today. On Friday, Nomi Const will be here, and she will be holding down the fort, doing a recap, doing one of the the DNC shows that she's been doing. They've been great, and and the guests that she has on Friday are going to be nuts. Um, let me just, let me just drop this on you, Chomsky. Anyways, um, but today, and and you could tune into her show today, uh, today, Sarah Nelson, she is, um, the, uh, president of the flight attendance union. We've interviewed her on this program, I think on ring of fire as well. The flight attendance union basically broke the back of the Republicans uh, government shutdown plan. And she is a rising star in the, if not already a risen star 
in the union movement in this country. Uh, she, then she will have a panel, uh, Nabila Islam, Matt Stoller, Francesca Fiorentini will be uh, talking about the DNC. Um, we will be talking about it a little bit on this program today, obviously a little bit with Ben Wickler. Um, but uh, check out Nomi's show. You can go to youtube.com, the Nomiki show on YouTube and watch it at 3 p.m. You can watch it tomorrow at 3 p.m. And then Friday, it's going to be here on noon. Um, so check that out. Let's do this um, brief. Uh, here's Steve Ducey. You know, one of the things about the uh, Republican, and, and right now, uh, Mitch McConnell, the, remember, the, the, the negotiations were going on between Nancy Pelosi and Steve Mnuchin. And, um, and Donald Trump's been saying, like, we really don't need to do anything. I think we're fine. And I think Donald Trump's getting that. I mean, I think Donald Trump is getting played a little bit, frankly, um, by the Senate Republicans. You recall there was reporting, I don't know, about three or four months ago that were basically saying if, if things look like they do now after Labor Day, the Republicans maybe are going to cut a little bait. I don't think they're going to do so publicly. They're not going to do it. They're not going to do it publicly in any way because they're all afraid because their voters are all still Trumpistas. But that means they're going to start to plan for a Biden administration. And what that means is they are not looking to save anything. So uh, Senate Re Republican leaders are preparing to uh, offer a $500 billion relief package that will include extended payments for unemployed people, but it'll be smaller, uh, and small business. The measure is going to include $10 billion for the post office, which is not enough for long-term fix. Um, and then they are uh, hoping for negotiations over a far larger coronavirus bill expected to resume after Labor Day. Um, so... The idea that uh, the Senate Republicans would pass something now, of course, is just their way of saying, like, if Trump looks like he's losing after Labor Day, we don't have to go back into these big negotiations. We got enough just to cover us and make it look like we've done something for the next month or two. So that they're trying to protect some of their Senate seats. That's that's the that's the game. Uh, we will see if the Democrats um, are, are too short-sighted to realize that. The way they've been playing, it's total prevent defense. But here's Steve Ducey on Fox and Friends sitting down with Liz Cheney and talking about his concept of the economy. I mean, I want you to think about, like, for a moment, what does the economy mean to you? Like, when people say the economy, what does that mean? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean, like, the... the w w when we talk about the, a good economy, what do we want the economy to do? The, the numbers get bigger on CNBC. Well, the, <laughs> well, for some people, I mean, that's my point, is that I think when most people think like, we, I want a good economy, that means that my family and my neighbors and everybody else's family are able to make enough money without having too much stress to be able to provide for their families food and shelter and maybe, you know, a couple of weeks of vacation, you know, uh, or, or, you know, that's based, it's the well-being of as many people as possible in the country should be the measure of what, of how the economy is doing. But for some people, it's something different. And here's Steve Ducey to sort of stumble over that. Congressman, the number one issue facing America right now, Pause it obviously for one second. the coronavirus. I just want to make it clear that Liz Cheney is a congresswoman. Let's start again. Congressman, the number one issue facing America right now, obviously the coronavirus. When the coronavirus really hit and we realized things are going to have to get shut down for a while, the stock market absolutely tanked. Yesterday marked the end of the shortest bear market in history because just like the president said, it was going to be a V. It went down and it has gone clear back up. It's right on the edge of uh, record highs as well. And one of the things the Democrats for the last couple of months have thought, 
Okay, Donald Trump's not going to have the economy to run on, but right now, aside from the unemployment, which is still staggering, the economy is doing okay. Well, look, and I think it's absolutely clear to the American mm -hmm. people, you know, the Democrats have combined the failed policies of the past with this fraud of socialism that they have <laughs> see as our future. And if, uh, if the Democrats prevail, we will not have an economic recovery. Every single policy that they've put forward is one that will make it much, much more difficult for us to recover from the pandemic, to get the economy back going again where we need it to be. The economic policies that we've seen from President Trump and from the Republicans in the House and the Senate over the course of the last three and a half years, the cuts in regulation, the cuts in taxes, those are the kinds of things that we've got to see to bring this economy back again, to get people back to work. Uh, socialism, which... <laughs> OK, whatever. The point <laughs> being that the only thing that they're sort of assessing is the economy is um, the stock market. And then, you know, there's a lot of the millions of people out of work. But aside from that. Like what, can, you know, the we know that 80 percent of the stocks are owned by something like 20 percent of the people. And that fully 60 percent of the country doesn't even participate in the stock market. This is the vision of, well, certainly on Fox. They, I mean, they're just naked about it. At least the, the, the Democratic Party pays some lip service. <laughs> and I'm not sure how many of the people in the Democratic Party uh, fully believe that the economy should be measured as to how it, it functions for the greatest number of people. But on Fox, they don't even pretend. And to hear Liz Cheney just wax uh, poetically about uh, socialism. It's amazing how they've been talking about this as the Democrats have Colin Powell and John Kasich speak at the convention. Well, they're desperately trying to do, you know, I mean, that's, that's what they're desperately trying to do. And that's what the, the Democrats are running on this complete prevent defense. And I mean, we'll talk about that in, in a moment. And that is, um, all of us who really know something about the prevent defense know that that is not a winning strategy. Now, in this instance, it might be. Broadly speaking, you know, when you've got a coronavirus. Um, sometimes the lead is big enough. Sometimes the lead is big enough. And I don't know. It, it, um, it you know, well, we'll talk about that. I mean, I, you know, like I watched the, uh, the convention and I just wonder, like, what would they have done if there was no coronavirus? Now, they would have come up with something. But I wonder if, I, I wonder how much that has contributed to uh, this prevent defense. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so uh, oftentimes, I'm looking around for charities, charities that we will contribute uh, to via the show, like uh, as we do merchandise stuff. Sometimes I'm looking for, for charities that I, um, I want to contribute to personally. And with the data that came out, I mean, this data has been floating around for a while. There's been a lot of um, evidence that um, giving directly to people, giving like people living in poverty money actually gets them out of poverty. I mean, I know that sounds sort of like uh, uh, overly intuitive, but um, that is the case. And now people have all sorts of different charities they like to give to. Every year across the globe, you have people who are suffering from diseases that are easily preventable or things like uh, poverty that's easily pre preventable. Um, if you are one of those people who are in a position to give and want to help, you want to try and support charities. I think everybody knows this where your next donation will save and improve lives the most. You want as much bang for your buck as possible. Uh, and that is the mission of givewell.org. For over 10 years, givewell.org has helped donors find the charities and projects that save and improve lives the most per dollar. And here's how GiveWell dedicates over 20,000 hours a year to researching charitable organizations and handpicks a small set of the highest impact evidence-backed charities. GiveWell isn't asking for donations themselves. They're asking that you give to the amazing charities they've recommend, like the Helen Keller International Against um, uh, and Against Malaria Foundations, 
Plus, GiveWell.org takes no fees, so all of your tax-deductible donation will go to be uh, used to be help these charities. Uh, through GiveWell, I found Give Directly. I don't know that they're, I don't think they're, I think that's uh, the Give part is just um, a coincidence. But Give Directly is a charity that gives money directly to people living in extreme poverty. And particularly after we saw the implications of, of the $1,200 um, per person under the, uh, the $70,000 threshold and the, the bump in unemployment benefits from the federal government, poverty was at its lowest rates in this, in this country uh, in uh, ages. And so um, I went on to givewell.org. I looked through the charities. I saw Give Directly. And that's the charity um, I'm now focused on these days. So if you want to have even more impact with what's going on, you can donate soon. Any of our listeners who become new GiveWell donors will have their first donation matched up to $100 when you select podcast as to how you heard about it and majority report at checkout. This matching offer is as good as long uh, as, long as funds last. So uh, head over to a GiveWell dot org when you select podcast and majority report you'll get your um donation and they have a bunch of different um of of charities on there that you can that you can give to uh and you'll get that matched so uh, check that out also um we all shop online particularly through this uh pandemic when i was inclined to use a certain company. I'm not going to use the name because I don't know if the sponsors want me to use that name, but I decided I'm not going to go to this one thing. That's like a clearinghouse. It's almost like its own market. And I'm going to go to uh, specific stores directly. But then you have that issue of like, am I getting the best deal? Well, uh, a while back, actually, um, I had made sure that that was never a problem. Honey is the free browser extension that scours the internet. It looks for the promo codes, applies the best one it finds, and adds it to your cart automatically. So once you put it in as a browser extension, you don't have to worry about that anymore. It used to be, I would sit Mila down. If you're going to buy some clothes from wherever this place is, you search for the coupon code, then you try it, and the third one works. Maybe the fourth one works, and then you save five, 10 bucks. It's better than this, you know, poking the eye. I mean, it's, it adds up to some real cash. But the beauty with Honey is that when you check out, Honey button drops down, and all you have to do is a click and apply and hit apply coupons. You wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If they find one that works, you'll watch as the prices drop. Honey has found over 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. Like I say, um, I had to walk Mila through the whole coupon code thing, and then I just got her honey, and then we don't have to deal with it. Uh, and she's buying all sorts of stuff. Um, clothing. And sometimes she tells me, I got a couple of bucks off. It's pretty exciting. If you don't already have honey, you could straight up uh, be missing out on free savings. And it's literally free and it installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you're doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash majority. That's joinhoney.com slash majority. All right, let's play a couple of clips of the, um, uh, of what we saw last night. I, I got to tell you, and do we have, we have any clips of the, um, of the uh, nomination thing, Brendan? I don't think we, we pulled that. I think we forgot. Yeah, we can that. pull it though. All right, pull something like that because, all right, look, first we'll do the things that I found a little bit annoying. Um, or maybe not some, well, let's, let's do the thing that I found annoying. Let's get that over with. The Democrats are clearly playing with this convention a, def a prevent defense, right? Where it's just, we're going to put up any potential critique. We're going to give, they're basically doing, it's, it's an extension of Joe Biden. Right. I mean, what, what why did people vote for Joe Biden? They voted for Joe Biden because they thought that he was the most the the guy most situated to beat Donald Trump. And why is that? 
It's because they just thought he was sort of more or less bland uh, in terms of his policies and uh, wasn't going to in any way be aggressive enough in uh, dealing with the problems of this country that the Republicans could latch on to. Like Matt said earlier, the idea of Lindsey Cheney talking about socialism with Joe Biden as the nominee is just is absurd. They've tried desperately to say that Joe Biden is in Bernie Sanders' pocket. Nobody buys it. We wish. <laughs> um, and it doesn't work. And the, um, the brainiacs at, uh, the, in the Biden campaign want to continue with this, where this is the second night in a row they put on prominent Republicans. I think um, maybe technically Colin Powell is not a um, Republican anymore after he uh, supposedly was fooled into leading us into a horrible, disastrous war for uh, obviously uh, more disastrous if you were uh, an Iraqi, um, depending on whose count you want to if you want to go with the Defense Department's very conservative count, you're talking a couple hundred thousand people. If you're going with other counts, it can go anywhere from 400,000 to a million people. We do know for a fact that there were 2 million internal refugees, 2 million external refugees. We know that everything that happened with ISIS subsequent to that, also a direct function of this. The war in Syria also could very well have been, at least in part, a function of this destabilization. I mean, I could go on and on. And I'm not saying that uh, Colin Powell is one of those guys who needs to be on a docket for crimes against humanity. I would let that up to prosecutors, whereas I feel more confident about George Bush and Dick Cheney. But the idea that we are bringing him out, and I don't care if he's still popular with your conservative uncle who listens to NPR. The idea that we are bringing this guy out there and saying this is a voice of reason we should listen to. He effed up at best, and it cost hundreds of thousands of people their lives. But here he is talking about his shared values with Joe Biden. Former Secretary of State Colin Powell. 100 years ago, a young immigrant left a dirt farm in Jamaica and set out for America. Three years later, a ship pulled into New York Harbor and a young Jamaican woman gazed up at the Statue of Liberty for the first time. They became my parents and they inspired me to finish college and join the army. This began a journey of service that would take me from basic training to combat in Vietnam, up the ranks to serve as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of State. The values I learned growing up in the South Bronx and serving in uniform were the same values that Joe Biden's parents instilled in him in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I support Joe Biden for the presidency of the United States because those values still define him, and we need to restore those values to the White House. Our country needs a commander-in-chief who takes care of our troops in the same way he would his own family. For Joe Biden, that doesn't need teaching. It comes from the experience he shares with millions of military families, sending his beloved son off to war and praying to God he would come home safe. Joe Biden will be a president we will all be proud to salute. With Joe Biden in the White House, you will never doubt that he will stand with our friends and stand up to our adversaries, never the other way around. He will trust our diplomats and our intelligence community, not the flattery of dictators and despots. He will make it his job to know. Pause it for one second. Anyone okay, dares I just to want to remind you that, that Colin Powell's story is that he was lied to by George Tenet, the head of the CIA. That's his story. That's the, that's the Reformation project. That's what Larry Wilkerson goes around and says. His number two. So, like, are you really getting in front of the American public? The Democrats are platforming you, and you're saying he's a guy who's going to trust his intel agencies? How about having just like, you know, maybe the proper skepticism and, uh, you know, uh, really make an assessment as to what, what the information he's getting. Or maybe like he's not going to out of hand dismiss them because they're not telling him what they want to hear. 
that that Colin Powell would have a little experience with. That was the administration he served in. Another thing, Joe Biden will never be my commander in chief because I'm not in the military. Like most Americans who are not in the military, he is not the commander in chief. He is the president. He's the commander in chief of the military, but not of the country. So I'm not going to salute Joe Biden because I'm not in the military. So it's not when we will all salute. We won't all salute Joe Biden. Continue. That's in our intelligence community, not the flattery of dictators and despots. He will make it his job to know when anyone dares to threaten us. He will stand up to our adversaries with strength and experience. They will know he means business. I support Joe Biden because beginning on day one, he will restore Americans' leadership and our moral authority. He'll be a president who knows that America is strongest when, as he has said, we lead both by the power of our example and the example of our power. He will restore America's leadership in the world and restore the alliances we need to address the dangers that threaten our nation, from climate change to nuclear proliferation. Today, we are a country divided, and we have a president doing everything in his power to make it that way and keep us that way. What a difference it will make to have a president who unites us, who restores our strength and our soul. I still believe that in our hearts, we are the same America that brought my parents to our shores, an America that inspires freedom around the world. That's the America Joe Biden will lead as our next president. Thank you very much. All right. Now, look, you know, I mean, even if they had just done this as an ad, you know, I mean, because I get it. I get the appeal. And I appreciate that he says the things that really threaten us, like climate change and nuclear proliferation. But they could have just put it on an ad. Yeah, what's the point of targeted advertising if I also have to watch this stuff? (laughs) Exactly. It's just, it's just, you know, part of the reason why we have some of these problems is a function of the lack of accountability that we hold our past leaders to. And I'm just sorry. I'm not saying that the guy needs to be in a gulag, but I just, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a big distance between being platformed at the democratic national convention and, um, and going into a gulag. All right. Uh, let's take a, uh, well, um, I think we got him on the line. We will bring him on in just a second. Let's do it. Uh, well, yeah, give me, give me, uh, let's play a little bit of music and then we'll be right back with uh, Ben Wickler, the chairman of the Wisconsin Democratic Party. Okay, on the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome to the program the chairman of the Wisconsin Democratic Party, Ben Wickler. Ben, welcome to the program. Sam, it's great to be with you. Appreciate it. Is it the first time you've ever been on the program? No. You can't be. I don't know. I can't imagine. I think I was on the move on. Oh, yeah, or maybe a Vaz. Um, Ben and I uh, first met each other uh, back in the Air America days. Um, 2004. When you were uh, a producer of the uh, biggest show on the network, and I remember walking into uh, uh, you were producing Al Franken's show. I walked into the, um, the uh, Franken's office. I looked up at the board, and 
that you guys had created this massive full wall length grid of like every show for the next like month. And I just, I, I walked out of that room and I walked down the hall and I almost started weeping based when I was like, I was like, where, where am I going to get my Ben Wickler? Uh, and you actually sent me somebody. Um, uh, that's how I, uh, jo Josh Horton ended up working on the show. But um, that level of, 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 of expertise and organization is now going towards making sure that we win Wisconsin. I want to talk about that a little bit, but let's talk about the convention. It is sort of taking place in Milwaukee, like it was supposed to. <laughs> um, give me, I mean, uh, just give me a sense of like what was going on in terms of like the preparation for Milwaukee, why Milwaukee was so crucial to have it there. And to what extent is there sort of like, is well is is Wisconsin getting I don't know the convention bounce. So there's one reason why the convention was going to be in Milwaukee, and that reason is that according to just about every model, if you do three states, two states, or one state, Wisconsin is the state most likely to tip the electoral college one way or the other if the race is close. The Trump campaign last year had a briefing where they said uh, it was secret recorded and leaked. If we win Wisconsin, we win the election. If we lose Wisconsin, we lose the election. And a convention is a tactic to win the election. That's the, that is the fundamental premise. So the DNC had the selection process. They looked at, you know, Florida and Texas and Wisconsin. And uh, it didn't hurt that, that Tom Perez, his wife was from Wisconsin. His daughter was a UW-Madison student and he got married here in our state. Uh, but fundamentally, he was looking at the math and this is where it had to be. So Milwaukee got the pick. And then the other side of the convention unfolded, which is when you have a convention, especially in a city that's relatively small, like Milwaukee, relative to other major metropolises, it was going to be a giant, giant boon to the city. The biggest spotlight that had ever been cast on, on Milwaukee. Uh, 50,000 visitors, hundreds of millions of dollars of economic stimulus. You know, if you talk to like, performing magicians and musicians and you know people who make murals and all this kind of stuff it was going to be this incredible moment to actually shine to have national eyes and ears on their stuff uh, every venue was booked every hotel room was booked every hotel room for miles around uh, all the way to like madison and you know suburbs of chicago uh were, were booked up for the convention and then the pandemic hit and some form of it was going to hit no matter what but Trump completely flubbed, completely failed the response. And so while other countries like had their COVID moment, had their shutdown, got their act together, got it under control, have reopened, have stuff happening. You know, you see the photos from, uh, from Wuhan, from South Korea, from you know, all over the place, there's stadiums full of people doing stuff here. Uh, what started as a few weeks shutdown went into a total shutdown. And now the convention is fully completely virtual and it is, it has been very tough for Wisconsin to not have the kind of like civic, economic stimulus and energy and excitement. But this amazing thing happened over the last couple of days, which is that people had sort of had their hearts broken, and now we're actually experiencing a convention that has stuff happening that wouldn't even have been possible if it had been in person. That roll call could not have happened, and that. Right now, like when I talk to the Wisconsin delegates to the convention, we're going to have the experience of their lives, you know, going to all these parties, all this kind of stuff. They're pumped. They're super excited about what they're seeing. And that feels really good. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that the the roll call, because um, I, I just talked about how annoyed I was about um, uh, Colin Powell being, um, you know, sort of. Uh, platformed there like you know i'm okay with an ad because you got to win the election but i just think that it, it it i hate the idea of the institution of the democratic party whitewashing anybody who was that um that involved in selling us the iraq war uh frankly but uh the 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 roll call thing i gotta say i mean i was watching this it is First of all, it's better than it is when you do it in the convention hall because you actually get to see the people in the context in which they live and you get to see them and hear them uh, in a way you don't get it, uh, you know, in the roll call. And 
I, you know, I was just genuinely impressed with how diverse this country is and how diverse the Democratic Party is. And I'm sure, you know, uh, part of that is 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 constructed to make it look diverse. But when I contemplate like what the Republican Party, if they were to do that, I mean, that would be the, the c- comparison would be shocking. Yes. I mean, it would be yeah. shocking. You just have one white guy after another, more or less the same age in 50 states. And what we saw on that, that, that thing, do we have a clip of that, Brendan? We want to play a little bit of a clip of it. It was just really impressive. This is just Alaska the beginning. Cast with a, go ahead. Seven votes for Bernie Sanders and 12 votes for the next president, Joe Biden. California, home to our next vice president, Kamala Harris, cast 231 votes for Bernie Sanders. And, and 263 votes for our next president, Joe Biden. Indiana casts two votes for my friend Bernie oh, Sanders and 86 votes for the next president, Joe Biden. <laughs> I mean, the yeah, of see our state proudly cast 10 votes for Bernie Sanders and 35 votes for our next president, Joe Biden. <laughs> Montana cast one vote for Bernie Sanders and 18 votes for our next president, Joe Biden. New Mexico proudly casts four votes for Bernie Sanders and 42 votes for the next president of the United States of America, Joe Biden. Okay. North Carolina see, uh, cast. Yeah, this is the and this is the short and this is the shortened version, and you know you have people on there who, you know I I don't know how many I- I indigenous folks were on there. I mean it was just like a cross section of Americans. Um, I think there was a couple people delivered in in Spanish. Um, it was it was I, I found the whole thing really impressive. People spoke their tribal languages. It was I like watched that and I was like. This has always been a multilingual country and it will always be a multilingual country. And that is like, that is, there's so like the diversity was so inspiring because of this, you know, shared sense of like, we are, we're going to do this together. We're in this together. And that is actually the only way that Democrats win is to be able to actually pull people together across race and geography and ethnicity and you know, tribal affiliation and all these other dimensions. That is, that is what this party is. And it was seeing seeing ourselves reflected back from the screen was amazing. All right. So with that said, let's also um, let's also address the other question. First off, do you have a sense? Because one thing that that you know that that and 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 we saw it in the context of of uh, of that roll call. We had some union people in there. You you had like that shot of uh, of Pete Buttigieg, who was sort of like in this like modern techie looking um, office building. There was a couple other guys from like Delaware who looked like they were, you know, uh, just heading off to have a drink at the country club. But there was also uh, a lot of working uh, people who were in there. And so, you know, I mean, uh, one of the problems I think that we had in Wisconsin, although I wanted you to, to talk about it, was one like it was with working people and with um, with um, uh, um, primarily black folk too in Milwaukee uh, in terms of turnout. Like, give me a sense of, of what went wrong in Wisconsin last year. So I think you're asking about what went wrong in Wisconsin in 2016. 2016, sorry, last time. Yep. So 2016, first of all, both candidates wildly underperformed. People did not like either of them. Uh, they both got fewer votes than not only than Obama, who won in 2008 and 2012, also fewer than Romney, who lost in 2012, and fewer than George W. Bush and John Kerry in 2004. Wow. Hundreds of thousands of people didn't vote. And both the Green and Libertarian candidates got more than a winning margin in Wisconsin, which was 22,748 votes. So there was a lot of none of the above voter response that year. Second thing is the polling was wildly off. And so both candidates for most of the race and then the Clinton campaign specifically until the very end thought that Wisconsin wasn't a battleground state. The first ad that the Clinton campaign ran was started the week of October 28th. The Trump campaign sort of sensed this opportunity and started quietly doing stuff in Wisconsin for for a bit longer than that. But it just wasn't like it. Nobody's model had Wisconsin as the tipping point. We should be clear. Be part of the blue wall. We should be clear that the, when you say the polling was way off, the 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 Wisconsin state polling. Yes, exactly. The polls of Wisconsin found that that if you average the, the real clear politics polling average on election day, had Clinton up six and a half points right. in Wisconsin. 
And, and Feingold, that, too, up. right? And Feingold. Points. Yeah, Feingold was ahead the entire time. I saw him a bunch of times that year, and he, he never was behind in the polls. And it was all wrong. <laughs> and it was like, so if you look at how it was wrong, uh, turnout was down in Milwaukee by 40,000 votes relative to, to 2012. That was about an eighth of the swing from Obama to Trump, um, 2012 to 2016. Half the swing was in communities where less than 1,000 people cast ballots. So it was this massive margins that were racked up in small towns in rural Wisconsin all over the state. Suburbs actually moved towards Clinton in 2016, and Dane County smashed every turnout record and you know, made it a lot closer than it would have been otherwise. So... You know, the, the biggest the biggest thing was small town of rural areas and uh, and Milwaukee. And I think one of the structural factors was that, a couple of structural factors I'll point to. One is the smashing of organized labor, systematic dismantling of the labor movement in Wisconsin by the the Walker team, which there's one political science study that really carefully looks and finds that when you go from being a you know unionized state to a right to work state, it shifts the presidential vote share by three and a half percentage points. Because unions, being part of a union, hearing from your union about who's going to look out for your interests from someone you trust, that changes how you vote. And unions are engines of get out the vote operations, not only for union households, but for everybody, including in communities of color. In, in Wisconsin, AFSCME was created, public employee unionism was created in Wisconsin. And that's who Scott Walker went on after first with Act 10 and the, the massive Wisconsin uprising in 2011. Yep. So the smashing of labor and the other side is just straight up voter suppression which included uh, some of the harshest voter ID laws in the country, gerrymandering, which makes state legislative races less competitive, which drives down turnout, uh, the changes in the way people register to vote, uh, which made it hard to do in-person voter registration drives, like all these different changes that really were targeted to suppressing especially black votes and, and you know, votes to a lesser extent. Uh, and then young people, they, they made student IDs only work for two years. So if you're in a four-year college, uh, you need to go get a new ID in order to be able to vote. We just beat that in court, but that was in place in 2016. So all, like, there's so many things that they did surgically to make it hard for us to win. And that partly like that threw off the polling because polling doesn't account for whether people are going to get their votes suppressed. Uh, yeah. There are other problems with polling too. So this year. And we should we've, say, we've we been, should say, let me just interject one thing here. When you have a state where everybody assumes is not in play, the resources that go into polling are less. There's not as many yeah. polls there's just, because there's just not as much of a market for I mean, because people have to spend money on the polls and somebody's got to pay for it. And they just don't spend as much energy or attention on a state that they don't think is in play. There's, and it's, there's polls. There's a lot of kinds of research. There's, there's focus groups. There's having, you know, tracking panels of people over time. There's all these things you can do to figure out what's going on and also to do it at, at you know, a regional level within specific regions of the state, within specific communities and demographics. You, exactly as you say, you just don't do that. You don't pay attention when you think that something's not going to be a problem or an opportunity. And this time it is so night and day different. Wisconsin is, is you know, every aspect of everything here is scrutinized because people know. I mean, the one thing I will also say, Wisconsin had three out of the past five presidential elections had under one percentage point margins. So this, it was the closest date in the country in 04. Clinton, excuse me, John Kerry and George W. Bush were here over and over and over, like 17 times from the conventions to, to election day. And it was the second closest state in the country in 2000. It was actually, uh, in terms of numerically, it was closer in 2000 than it was in 04. So Obama blew it out of the water to such a degree. And the fact that Democrats did win both of those contests, it meant that when you look on paper, Wisconsin's, you know, blue from 1984 to 2012 looks fine. But elections have been very hard fought here very often. Um, for whatever reason, that was that was missed in 2016. It is not missed now. And what we've been doing at our state party is really my predecessor chair started a an organizing program modeled on the Obama neighbor to neighbor model where you build local teams led by members of their own community that organize volunteers and the organizers on the on the staff of the of the of the state party, they basically train and mentor these local leaders to build their own canvassing operations. I was elected in 2019 and, and just have been working to put that on rocket fuel. So we've had this gigantic year-over-year -year investment in grassroots organizing, and 
you could sort of see the result of it in our spring Supreme Court election this year when we had volunteers in every part of the state that could ultimately turn on a dime with coronavirus and switch to teaching people how to re- request absentee ballots, which is something that is hard to do here and, and has not been done in significant numbers here before. But we had this massive wave, four times the previous record of absentee ballot requests. We won absentee ballots in a landslide. Uh, we, we defeated a sitting Supreme Court justice for the second time in half a century. And uh, I think maybe helped freak Trump out about mail-in voting, which he's you know now dismantling America's most popular institution in order to prevent uh, which we also have to set step now and have a plan around that. But that is that is the, the recent history of politics here. The right bringing the system and us investing and organizing to get around that. So what is the uh, what does the polling look like this time around? I mean, the the interesting you know, change in the dynamic is I would imagine, you know, whereas the uh, Trump campaign was trying to be very targeted and surgical and quiet while they were doing this so that they wouldn't tip the, uh, the Clinton campaign off as to like, maybe they're, you, you're not as safe in Wisconsin as you think. I would imagine now it's more like um, nobody's, you know, nobody's trying to play that game. Everybody realizes we're mobilizing everything in these places. Do you, do you have a sense of what the polling looks like? I mean, are there, are there, are there, are there public polls? Let's put it that way. Yeah, there's a bunch of public polls. Uh, they have us an average of four or five points up right now. Um, there's, you know, some outliers in, in both directions. But if you look at the kind of gold standard polls, it's, it's a four or five point margin right at the edge or just over the edge of the margin of error. Um, no candidates breaking 50 percent yet, which is really, really where you want to be. Because right. that's scary. But it, yeah. It's and scary that you don't have 50 percent. Right. Like I would rather I would rather a, 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 a three point lead than a uh, with me over 50 percent than a five point lead with me not under uh, with me under 50 percent. Let's put it that way. Exactly. And it's just like especially what everyone is freaked out about is our people, especially because Trump is so nakedly racist and this was so horrible after George Floyd's murder. Are people are there a lot of you know white voters who don't want to admit that they support Trump? And so their registry is undecided in polls, but they will actually come home to him on election day. And, you know, with this margin, especially being under 50, we're just going to organize like we're two points behind all the way through. And if we get to the end and discover that we wanted a blowout, that is delightful. But under no circumstances do I want us to like let up on the gas for even a second on the basis of polling saying that we're going to be okay, because we tried that and it was a, you know, unparalleled disaster for every human who will ever live. And so <laughs> this time it is just, it is, you know, to the wall, pushing as hard as we can. Uh, we're, we're doing these massive virtual phone banks now calling people who um, we haven't spoken to before to find like every possible person who's willing to, to turn out and vote against Trump and then help those people to get an FCD ballot here. You have to upload a photo of your voter ID to a form on the internet to get a ballot sent to the address where you've already proven that you live to register to vote by showing your ID, which is a right. system literally built by the GOP to keep people out. Um, but we are helping people do that in, in a massive way. And then if needed, people can hand deliver their absentee ballots. If the, if the mail service is screwed up, um, we have to do everything we can. All right. So let me just go back to, uh, to, to, to see if I got what, what you're saying correctly about what happened in 2016 in terms of the numbers there was, um, uh, whatever number of voters who went from you had a a tremendous amount of voters stay at home because they didn't like either candidate. And then you had a certain number of voters who went from Obama to, um, to, to Trump. Right. And you're saying that like um, we had a, that, that those voters, the second group came from small rural towns who came out to vote in, in for the first time in years, essentially, and that the voters who stayed at home were basically in Milwaukee, more or less. That is, yeah, more or less right. There was also a third party vote. I think you left that piece out. Right. OK. Um, but and the, there's, a, there's a difference of opinion about how much there was an actual like surge for Trump in rural areas and how much it was just a swing for Trump. Uh, and it's hard to it's hard to figure out exactly from the data. But what's clear is that Trump, you know, 
there were rural areas of Wisconsin. There are some areas, especially southwestern Wisconsin, that have been blue over and over that turned red in 2016. And there's other areas that have been reddish that turned deep red. It was just like Trump just ran up the score in rural Wisconsin. And we don't and, know if that's yeah. a function of, of new rural voters um, coming in or just all, you know, or uh, existing blue, you know, uh, existing Democrat votes in those rural areas staying at home. So we have some information about it. Wisconsin's data is notoriously bad because we have same day voter registration, which is great. But when someone same day registers, instead of like changing their existing voter registration, they show up as a new person. And so there's always this effort, you know, there's all this work to do to figure out exactly which voter this is. What we what we do know for sure is that Western Wisconsin, these this swing area that had been blue went red for Trump, and then we won it back in 2018, and we won it again this spring in, in the spring of 2020. And so, whether people you know just kind of like went on a date with Trump and now are back in the fold or back in play, or whether it's a different group of people, like that's a, that's an area where it's very competitive for us in Northeast Wisconsin. Green Bay, Appleton, the Fox River Valley area, this whole other region, that is also a big swing region that Trump is obsessed with. And we're fighting for votes there, too. Those are kind of the big swings. The Northwest used to be, Dave Obey was a congressman, Democratic congressman for decades. But that is like, the, it's so kind of in the Fox News thrall. We're organizing, we're, we're closing the margins there, but it is it's not, it's not going blue at this moment. It's very, very tough. I mean... Um, yeah. Wisconsin, like Ohio, to some extent, like Michigan, to some extent, is um, in Illinois, are, are, are states that seem to me to really capture the different dynamics that exist in the American electorate, broadly speaking. I mean, you know, I don't want to over, you know, uh, over exaggerate. And I think there's some cohorts that aren't, aren't sort of represented there. But this particularly the, the urban rural dynamic uh, is captured in these states quite a bit, right? I mean, so, you know, it used to say, like, as Ohio goes, the country goes, I think. I mean, it's sort of, like, shifted to, uh, let me see how all four of those states are going, or three of them, anyways. There's a um, comedian from Wisconsin who moved home and set up a website and Twitter account called As Goes Wisconsin, specifically premised on this idea that <laughs> as, Wisconsin, as Goes Wisconsin, so goes the nation. And, you know, if we, my... That doesn't uh, sound very Kepper, funny, that, Ben. What, what's that? It doesn't sound very funny. The actual content is excellent. Oh, okay. The name of it <laughs> does not contain the joke. All right, good. Yes. That's fine. Um, the, uh, if, if we win Ohio, we don't have to worry about Wisconsin. I would be delighted for us to do that. But Wisconsin, right now, it's, it's sitting, if you add up all the electoral college votes with the states where Trump is less popular than he is here, it's just shy of 270. And if you add up all the electoral college votes of the states where he's more popular than he is here, it's just shy of 270. So you, you kind of have to add Wisconsin or hopscotch over Wisconsin and you know, get them even harder to get safe if you want to get if you want to win for either candidate. And that's why the convention's here. And it's also why Trump is was here on Monday and Pence is here today. And like the GOP is, you know, they, they see this as the place to make their stand. And is it is already, it yeah. how much of a detriment is it? That I mean, look, Joe Biden is not um, traveling like uh, Trump is for uh, a number of reasons. Um, how much of a debt? How much of it? How much does that make your job harder? I think COVID makes it harder, but like, there's a real medium as the message aspect to how we're campaigning. We 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 are the party. Biden is the presidential candidate. Uh, that cares about people, that cares about healthcare, that cares about ending this pandemic. And if we don't end this pandemic, as we've now seen, you can't open the economy and open schools for any lengthy period of time because people are going to get coronavirus and start dying again. And so, like, the GOP is literally, they are back out knocking on doors in person. They're having in-person events. Their state convention, they had 300 people in a room watching uh, Congressman Gwen Grossman start coughing while he tried to say Trump's name. Like, the, the GOP is, they have their head in the sand. They're acting like it's not happening. And for some of their voters, that is the coolest thing ever. And for a lot of voters, that is like horrible. And, you know, the Biden campaign decision was to just really focus on public health, including this question of whether he was going to travel here in person. 
And that conveys how seriously we take the pandemic. Now, everyone in Wisconsin knows the Biden campaign is doing a ton to try to win here because every time you turn on a screen, you're going to see a Biden ad or a Trump ad and probably both. Um, we have organizers everywhere. You can't you, you, like, you know, people's phones are, are ringing with our calls all the time. Like everyone knows that we're a battleground state that the Biden campaign takes incredibly seriously. But the what the Biden campaign is communicating through its actions is that it's just not going to put people's health at risk in order to, to try to get their vote. And that is actually a good way of getting their vote. Um, what, uh, so lastly, Ben, if there are people who want to help out and you, you, you know, your state has been one of the states that I've been sort of like a f- focus on in this regard, but if people want to help out, what, what can they do? If they, how can they donate money, uh, to the, the state party? Can they, can they do calling? What do you, what, w- what would be helpful for folks to do if they want to focus on Wisconsin and help you out there? That is a great two item list of things to do. If you go to WIS dems.org w-i-s-d-e-m-s.org slash donate you can chip in you go to wisdems.org slash volunteer you can sign up to make calls uh, and and frankly like hours and dollars are the things that we need we are we're building this gigantic effort to reach out to everybody we're, we're calling we're also texting we're doing social media outreach all these different things and we use when we get money, we use it to hire organizers to recruit volunteers and recruit volunteer leaders. And you can cut out the middleman by volunteering directly. But frankly, we need both. So I'd be I'd be so grateful for a majority report listeners doing that. And I, I appreciate the question. Uh, ben, thanks for coming on, talking to us about this. I wish you guys luck. I, you know, I I, I couldn't feel more uh, confident, at least by about, you know, what you guys are doing. I hope you guys uh, pull it out, obviously for the sake of the country, but um, you know uh, it's, it's nice to feel like there's somebody super competent who is working on this. And uh, I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All right, folks, there you have it. Wis Dems. What do you say? Wis Dems.org. I don't know. I don't know what the Wis Dems, like wisdom, Wis Dems. I mean, I get it. Wisconsin Democrats, but why not Wisconsin Democrats.org? I'll talk to him about that. Uh, folks, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to head into the fun half of the program. We will talk more about, we've got a clip of Bill Clinton. We've got uh, the best endorsement for Joe Biden. And in fact, it is a non endorsement. Um, Donald Trump. Talking about Michelle Obama, of course. Um, Trump just rambling, and we've got some Fox and Friends, and of course Tucker Carlson, very worried about um, um, women who uh, are sexually uh, aroused. That that is a problem for him. He's very concerned about that. Um, Matt Walsh calling for the Insurrection Act. And to invade this country like the Middle East. Um, and uh, Donald Trump uh, has found a line that he, he likes to use now, apparently. So uh, check all of that out. Don't forget, 3 p.m. today, uh, Nomi is doing her, um, her DNC weekly, you know, daily show now. They're doing it all this week. They're going to do it all next week at 3 p.m. This week, uh, only on Friday, it's going to be at noon. And the guests are just nuts uh, that she has on Friday. Like I say, I think John's going to, I don't want to uh, tell any tales out of school. But, uh, but today, Sarah Nelson will be on that program. Nabila Islam, she was a great candidate, I think, believe from Georgia. I interviewed her. Matt Stoller, who's always brilliant. And uh, Francesca Fiorentini, who's uh, both um, uh, uh, smart and funny. Um, so check that out at 3 p.m. Also, don't forget, your support is what makes this show possible. You go to jointhemajorityreport.com. You not only support the free show. So, like, um, I mean, basically, you know, I, I got into this yesterday a little bit. The, uh, I have been told for years, do the fun half for the free show. Do the interviews for the members. And my attitude has been, no, I want folks like Ben Wickless, not as sexy. I'm Ben. I'm not saying that Ben is not a sexy person. I'm just saying in terms of content, it's not as sexy. Uh, ben is not that sexy as a person, but 
that's completely irrelevant. Yeah. The content. <laughs> thank you, Pat. <laughs> the, the content is not as sexy, right? Like you do an interview with, I don't know about we, you know, I don't know how many uh, times I've done interviews about postal banking, for instance, that's not the sexiest of, of, of content for your free show, but it's super important. And so we put it out there on the free show, but it's the members who actually allow us to do that by supporting the, you know, ostensibly supporting the member show. But really what you're doing is you're actually supporting the free show. And then we're doing the free show you're paying for. Does that make sense? Did, 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 am, I, am I talking myself into like a... Well, I mean, I would put it as like, there's a reason you eat dinner before dessert. But I understand your point too. How can right. you have your pudding if you don't eat your meat? That's also another way of putting it. But the point is, when you become a member, you support the free show. And then we give you extra content. Um, and uh, so uh, it's our members that make this possible. Join the majority report.com. Also, sign up for the AM Quickie. Uh, we're going to be on break uh, next week. Uh, like I say, Nomi's going to be doing her daily show about the RNC. But the AM Quickie, that is forever. That happens every day. You can get uh, six, seven minutes of headline news uh, in your, um, you know, uh, your podcast uh, feed of uh, by 8 a.m. almost every day now, 8, 8.30 at the latest. So check that out, amquickie.com. You can sign up. It's all free, of course. Just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority to get 10% off. Uh, Jamie, what's happening on the Antifada? Well... This week on the Antifada, we talk all about the DNC. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'll leave that to the experts. Uh, it, going back to actually a conversation we briefly had on this show when I was talking about fascism and whether Trump is a fascist or not, I realized this topic needed a more in-depth treatment for sure. So this week on the Antifada, we talk about what fascism is? Is it a process? Is it a system of governance? Uh, what are fascist economics? Is fascism compatible with neoliberalism? Um, spoiler alert, yes, it is. We go through a lot of different definitions by a lot of different thinkers and see how they can ma be mapped on to uh, our current predicament here in the United States. Um, also, we do a little bit of history and political economy of the U.S. Postal Service, a bailiwick of yours, I know, and uh, how the bar bipartisan attacks on the Postal Service have contributed to the situation we are currently facing. So that's out for free for everyone to listen to right now. Patreon.com slash the Antifada. Oh, you know what? That reminds me. We're going to we're going to do a uh, you know, everybody was like on me uh, during the fun half yesterday to, uh, you know, respond to um, uh, uh, Crystal Ball and Sager's uh, show. Um, uh, and and I said, well, look, if you have something specific you want me to deal with. And so somebody sent me something that Sager did about the uh, post office. It's a little bit splitty, hairy thing, uh, but, uh, you know, it's a good jumping off point. But the interesting thing um, that I mean, I I genuinely don't think that it is a um, the 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 prefunding bill was passed in a arguably bipartisan fashion, arguably because we don't really know the votes. There's no roll call. There were certainly co-sponsors, uh, Democrats who did it. But um, broadly speaking, it is far more the agenda of the Republican Party to prior to, uh, to privatize the Postal Service than it is the Democratic uh, Party, if only because um AFSCME is such an important part of the Democratic um, uh, electorate that they don't want that to go away. Um, I think they're happy to have it a little bit disempowered in certain instances, but I don't think they want it to go away. And, but with that said, you look at why DeJoy, and they haven't rolled back everything uh, as far as I, as far as I can tell, but why DeJoy is backed off on some of these, you know, so-called cost savings uh, measures. It is because of the universality of the postal service. I mean, this is the same thing that happens with social security. The value of having something of a policy that is universal, that is not means tested, that is universal, 
is its political durability. The reason why DeJoy is having to back off these measures is not because I am crowing about them or Chuck Schumer's crowing about them. The reason why he's having to back off these measures is because people in Iowa, people in Montana, people in rural areas are calling their Republican senators and Congress people and saying, hey, I can't get my medicine. The vets are calling their Republican governors and saying, I can't get my medicine. I can't get my postal service. I can't get my mail. I can't ship out packages. That piece I, I you know, um, sent away for to fix my tractors not here. And that universality causes pressure and gets much more response. And that is why they, you know, George Bush tried to privatize Social Security and it basically was the beginning of the end for that dude. Uh, when universal programs have political durability, period, end of story. Yeah, Matt, not to mention the kinds of hoops they make the poor jump through are dehumanizing and oppressive. Yes. No, that is that uh, uh, that's a there's a there's a there's a a moral uh, argument about it as well. And just sort of a reflection on like, you know, what the point of society is. But just sheerly from a um, a political perspective, um, the universality has uh, political durability. Matt, uh, last night on TMBS, we had Dustin Gastella, a writer and uh, a member of Teamsters Six Twenty Three in Philadelphia, to talk about how the left sort of took their eye off the ball with regards to a Tennessee Valley Authority labor dispute over them their attempts to outsource some IT jobs and allowed the right wing to run the Steve Bannon playbook on H-1B visas and fly the America First banner over the TVA and save the jobs of those workers. Uh, So we kind of talk about that in the context of this sort of post office and public goods and how we need to take these inheritances of actually good institutions seriously and protect them and expand them. So yeah, patreon.com slash TMBS. All right, folks, see you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Are you ready? <laughs> what, who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back. 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 Boy is back. And the alpha males are back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. I, I, I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break for people. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, fucking reminder. I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Almost says what? What 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black
there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Come on! <laughs> what? Come on! What? What? Come on! Really? Someone needs to pay the price of blasphemy around here! I, 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 I am a total pussy, 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 pussy. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. The fun half of the program. Um, let's take a couple IMs, shall we? Just down here at the bottom. Eric, thanks for a good show. Sometimes above my knowledge, but always interesting. Sometimes very fun. Sometimes. As a uh, 70s teen raised at a time of clash punk and reggae music, you start great. Jamie and some more sound like the 70s naive red, but it's okay. Remember, Send guns to Afghan rebels. I think your team will have a great and long careers. I'm a typical Norwegian social Democrat, but I've worked in, in Russia for seven years. I can say thank God for whoever U.S. For, for us paying high taxes. It works well to secure social safety, but no rest for the wicked. I agree. We need to solve the large structural changes. Uh, oh, uh, here we go. Uh, structural what changes. What you just say about me? <laughs> we need. I couldn't quite figure it out. We need to solve the large structural changes that is in the near future. All of us. You have a great week. I have for once listened to all programs from start to uh, start to, and I, Mister uh, and Majority Report. I mean, so in that way, you reached David Packman level. Good luck and Godspeed, Eric Berg. Um, I get the sense that Eric is uh, not, you know, English a little bit. Uh, PCT Joe, hi, uh, from Wisconsin, from someone that is still suffering from the Walker Union busting you mentioned in the interview. Thank you for your coverage on Wisconsin. It's what made me to decide to become a member and proudly wear your merch. Oh, well, thank you very much for that. Um, going to um, the, the first... Now, I don't know if I did it live remote. I think I might have, but I certainly recorded um very early on in this show because it this show started and this iteration started i think in november well, in november 2010 um our 10 year anniversary is a couple months away and i think it was like in march of february march of 2011 i went out to madison for a couple of days uh with the marches around uh the state capitol and it was really um, it was fascinating. It was exciting. And I think I did my first, um, live, I think my first live remote show was from walking on the streets with people who were protesting. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it was really, it was, um, it was really cool. There was a lot of sanitation workers. It was, it was just this huge, um, they were tractors. It was really like, like if you, like, like you're like almost like, um, I gotta say like my, my seven year old son would have really enjoyed it because there was like, <laughs> you had tractors come in one day and cause all the farmers came in cause they were cutting, uh, one of the, the sort of the Wisconsin, uh, version of like a Medicare Medicaid. There were a lot of construction workers. Uh, there were, they, they, uh, non big, big guys with big tools well, but, but they're wearing they're wearing the helmets the the firemen came in um to march that there sounds was, like a treat for you and your seven-year-old son yes, i was pretty excited too but there was also a lot of teachers the whole thing got kicked off by i think it was the um uh the what do you call that the the tas uh at university of madison so um it was a bunch it of was, PMCs spreading neoliberalism with their that, uh, labor action. That's right. There was there was a lot of PMCs there, tons of them. Um, all those teachers, teachers are PMCs. Hmm. Depends so who you ask. Well, it, according it, to the I, people who coined the phrase. Yeah, there's a there's some rhetorical somersaults that various people do in order to include or exclude whoever they happen to like. 
but but from the but category the who coined the phrase, right? It was Barbara Ehrenreich, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She, she included teachers and social workers. She the, sure did. Okay. So she doesn't get to define. She doesn't get to define it. I mean, uh, I'm ready to retire it personally. I think we've shown it does very little discursive work at this point in time. It has be kind of become like hipster, you know, it's just a oh, meaningless I, epithet. I think, that, I think that term is, is useless, frankly, but I just, uh, so I'm happy I think to retire. It used to be useful back when she was writing about it and its usefulness has decreased. 30 years ago. Yeah. 40 years ago. Um, all right. Let's uh, let's let's dig into this, Jamie. You didn't watch it, so watch you're what? Welcome, I did. The DNC. Okay, I'll bite. What's the DNC? The Democratic National Convention. Um, now you didn't watch it. I don't blame you. Um, you know, I gotta say, look, the value of this thing is. Um, they, they, there's been for years they questioned whether we should even have a DN like a news media like why are we doing why are we watching this going to it I have to say more interesting because I've gone in the past and I get to sit down with like union leaders and activists and you know some politicians but mostly like union leaders and activists and and other commentators and, and and it's interesting in that regard to me. Um, this is less interesting because yeah. we're not going. Yeah. The I was looking forward to going too. Yeah. Well, the interesting part of it now, or the only sort of analytical, um, the only value in its analysis is, well, let me, let me say this. I think there are people who make a category error where they perceive something like this as, um, indicative necessarily of what the nominee what the party is going to do because um and i think that cuts both ways i, I you know i don't think it's i don't think there's no promises here uh let's put it that way what is most relevant i think of this is just sort of like how does it work as a staged political event and getting and what kind of free media does it get? And, you know, which is why I'm, I'm more upset about like someone like Colin Powell in some ways than I am like Kasich getting a minute or two. I think it's silly, but whatever. Uh, and Susan Molinari, who I cannot stand. And, you know, uh, Christine Todd Whitman and Meg Whitman, like them getting a 60 seconds each. Fine. I just don't like the idea of something like, you know, as, Really, I mean, Susan Molinari was horrible, but she she didn't she didn't sell the country on war. She didn't use and Colin Powell. I want to make this very clear. When people like Colin Powell got up there and said we needed to go to war. That convinced a lot of people in the center left, as it were, that we needed to go to war. He was like, a you know, he was a respected figure across parties. That's why they wanted him to be the one to go to the UN. They could have sent somebody else. They wanted him to go because he, he leveraged that respect. And in my mind, when you do that, you burn it, you burn it. And he should not be getting any of that back. I don't like the rehabilitation of him. I can understand why they wanted to do it for uh, the election, but there's a lot of danger involved in this. I don't think there's danger involved in having John Kasich speak to the country. Like he's still a loon. He's going to be a loon tomorrow. He's got nothing. And it doesn't like wipe away the worst for a myriad of different reasons, foreign policy disaster of, I don't know, since Vietnam, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so that's why I, I harp on that. But let's look at other things with an eye to analysis. They only had Bill Clinton speak for four or five minutes. It's literally like an hour less than he's spoken at the last like four conventions. That's a slight exaggeration, but not really. And if it were up to me, he wouldn't speak, but he still speaks to a significant portion of the country. 
And, you know, I listen to the news, uh, you know, like the AP news in the morning. This gets a little bit of play. Here is Bill Clinton. Time like this, the Oval Office should be a command center. Instead, it's a storm center. There's only chaos. Just one thing never changes. His determination to deny responsibility and shift the blame. The buck never stops there. Now you have to decide whether to renew his contract or hire someone else. If you want a president who defines the job as spending hours a day watching TV and zapping people on social media, he's your man. Denying, distracting, and demeaning works great if you're trying to entertain or inflame. But in a real crisis, it collapses like a house of cards. COVID just doesn't respond to any of that. To beat it, you've got to actually go to work and deal with the facts. Our party is united in offering you a very different choice, a go-to-work president. I mean, there he is. He's talking directly to um, uh, Republican, you know, voters. I mean, he's, you know, that's the way he's doing it, I think. And he did get very, very high marks for FEMA and emergency response. And so he's talking like a technician there and, uh, and laying it out. Now, uh, I don't like the Dutch camera stuff. Uh, everybody knows that. I don't like that side shot. I think that's just absurd yeah. and bizarre. They did that with uh, Michelle Obama. But I think that is, you know, put him up there for five minutes. I'd rather not see him, but um, put him up there for five minutes, make the case from a completely pragmatic standpoint, very coronavirus centric uh, speech. And there it is. Uh, it's really just talking about technical efficiency. And that is the one thing that, I mean, like you've got people even like, I mean, I remember that Doug Henwood tweeted out just like, you know, Corona was enough to sort of say to people like, we need some basic functioning, right? We need some basic functioning from our government and we're not getting that. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is kind of funny to me when Democrats are like, Trump is bad because he doesn't do his job. Do your job, Trump. Like, I thought it was bad when Trump did things like we want him to be as distracted as possible because whatever he does is going to be bad. Well, I Not think from pandemic response, I think I think there is I think the idea is that um, there's no ideological there's no ideological options when it comes to a pandemic. You either do your job or you don't do your job. There's a lot of things that Trump does, obviously, that we don't want him to do because of the ideology. But I, I mean, honestly, you, you really, you can really follow that though, right? You can follow how people could say like, hey, we want you to do your job when it comes to a pandemic, but not do what you perceive your job to be when it comes to, let's say, education. I mean, he could decide that his job in a pandemic is like putting more immigrants in concentration camps. We don't want him to be doing that. Like, well, I think we have vastly different interpretations of what his job entails. I mean, he is sort of doing that uh, with the immigrants. I think they immediately deported them without even, uh, you know, uh, charging them, which apparently is actually like causing more immigration uh, across the border anyways because people feel like they're not getting it on their record. Um, but no, I mean, I think, I think what, uh, what Bill Clinton is saying, I think most Americans will get like, oh yeah, they want Trump to succeed at stopping the coronavirus from dictating every aspect of our lives. I'm pretty sure. That, I'm, I'm, sure I'm, I'm pretty sure most people get that. You're not really confused by that, right? Not in this instance, no. No, I didn't think so. Um, but that's, that is, you know, um, that is, I think like, you know, like it struck me last night in particular that, um, uh, they really oriented this towards the coronavirus and it's on some level, it's unfair to say like, what would they do if there was no coronavirus? Like, I mean, how could you ignore that at this point? Like, why would you? from in terms of doing politics, why would you? In fact, I, I was upset that Sanders, you remember that last debate, I think it was, or the second to last debate before um, the, the uh, you know, this hit. I was upset that Sanders did not frame this 
what was coming down the pike frame that debate in the context of coronavirus, because there's a real opportunity there to talk about sort of like an ideological perspective. Now, the DNC doesn't want to talk. They don't want to talk anything about ideology in the context of it. They just want to talk about it in terms of 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 just basic competence at governance. Get PPP to people, get um develop a testing regime, et cetera, et cetera. They don't want to say things like, hey, you know, if we already had a system where, you know, we provided, um, let's say, free uh, daycare or we had um, free taxpayer funded daycare, if we had taxpayer funded uh, health care, if we had a, an efficient system that was not set up to deny people unemployment claims, but rather to just facilitate it. Like in Canada, we played that video where, you know, some guy put on there like, he had four buttons. It's easier for him to get, to get um, unemployment uh, payments than it is to get, you know, I don't know, service for your weed whacker when, when uh, the string breaks or something. Oh my God. Um, like A friend of mine, it took until the other day from the beginning of the pandemic until now to get anything. Yes. I mean, the, de- like, the Democratic Party of my dream gets out there and says, this is the case why we need all these things. This is a perfect example. And you see it in black and white when we're under duress, when everyone is under duress in this country, you see the failure of us having an infrastructure. And, you know, that failure exists on a day to day basis when we don't have a crisis. But when we do have a crisis, it becomes that much more clear. And that's the DNC. That's the Democratic National Convention I would like to see. That's not going to happen until the nominee is AOC or somebody else or who knows uh, down the road. But um, they're, so they're exactly. But they are sticking with. Let's just see some basic competence. You know, <laughs> the technocratic competence. I think there always should be technocratic competence, but it should be really like. Um, well, I mean, I if, if the technocratic competence argument doesn't work this election, it should be retired forever and ever. Yeah. I would say. Well, yeah, I mean, here's the thing is that I also believe that from a technocratic standpoint, the most efficient way to do, to do, to deliver, I mean, this is the, this is the, 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 the lie of, of the whole technocratic thing is that this is the, the coronavirus and just like when you stick with just like, what are the basic things you need? You need testing and tracing, right? Like if we had tests that could turn around in 24 hours and a tracing mechanism, for the most part, we would all be in the office right now. We, you know, the kids going to school would not be so, um, uh, so problematic because we would be able to contain any type of outbreak before it becomes exponential in any way. And we don't have that the ability now. But the fact of the matter is, is that from a technocratic standpoint, if you're looking at efficiency, a single payer healthcare system is better. It's just, it's better. If you're looking at efficiency in terms of like how durable your social structure is, then being able to have unemployment benefits that are not given so grudgingly, that are actually like deployed when needed, providing basic necessities to people as a society makes your society more durable and more resilient to a situation like that. So there is a perfectly legitimate technocratic argument for a vast number of the things that people perceive as ideological. In fact, I would argue that, that, that stopping these things is not, is, is, is really technocracy that has an ideological underpinning in the tech, the, the, the technocratic arguments hide an actual ideology that's there is that we should not provide these things uh, because I don't think we should be giving handouts to people or I basically want to collect. I don't want my tax money going there. I mean, it's basically what comes out. Well, it's practical for the insurance companies who are blocking this kind of legislation. 
Well, but my point is, is that from a from a purely technological, uh, you know, a technocratic um, a perspective, the insurance company is a waste. <laughs> it's completely mm. inefficient. Well, if you think it's the government's job to provide the greatest good for all utilitarian yeah. style. Well, but I if mean, you think the government's job is to make sure the unemployment rate is low and people feel coerced to work, you might want to maintain a system like that. Yes. I mean, but the, and, and that's an ideological perspective, right? right. I mean, the, you know, like I'm just saying that, like, uh, I think the issue for me is not the, the technocratic solutions. The issue is, is that often the technocratic solutions are hiding an ideology, Right. That is contrary to what we perceive technocratic solutions are supposed to be about. Technocratic solutions are supposed to be the most efficient ones. But if you premise them with an ideological bent that we can't have government do this, even though it's the most efficient way to do it, well, then that's the problem in my mind. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the original positive sense of is of technocrat is like someone who doesn't have sectarian allegiances and is sort of an expert. And yeah, I mean, in that sense, it would be nice. Yeah. Well, all the experts, all the experts say that the most efficient way to deliver health insurance would be a single payer system. I mean, it is completely inefficient, the system we have now. We have people who are in charge of distributing health care, right? They're, they're in charge of distributing it in the form that they'll, whether they'll pay it or not, pay for it or not, who's primary job is to distribute as little health care as possible. That's what an insurance, that's the business model of an insurance company. I'm going to make money if I can pay out as little as possible. It's like I'm, my, my business model is to over promise. Yeah. You're killing people for money. Well, I mean, you know, if they can live, they live. I don't get paid more if they die because they stop their premiums. But if I could, it's like yeah, the death is not the point. It's uh, it's right. collateral, right? Well, the death is collateral. It cuts. It, well, you know, it's <laughs> I don't care. I'm agnostic you know, about whether they die. But you want to keep them on some kind of medication for decades, ideally. Yeah, that that is the ideal situation. I mean, look, this system is not efficient uh, at delivering insurance. So if you think if delivering health care, I should say, because that's what we really need. Uh, if you think that's its purpose, yeah, no, it fails at that. If you th it, on the other hand, you know, someone's sitting sitting over there thinks that the purpose is making money for insurance companies and keeping workers dependent on their employers and unable to act up, then it's working perfectly. Of course. Exactly. That is also I mean, that's that's the same perspective I had on the Iraq war. I, I think it was a disaster. But Dick Cheney thinks, no, well, it went more or less, you know. We had some uh, little wiggle room. It would be great if we had a, a complete uh, puppet in Iraq. Um, and uh, we, you know, kept Iran out, but more or less it worked out. You know, we were able to do that. We're good. Um, so here is Joe Biden's, maybe the, uh, the best endorsement that Joe Biden could get, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, kudos to the endorser for having the self-awareness of realizing that no one likes him and um, no one is going to um, take him as a cue as to who to vote for. And so uh, and this is one of the best endorsements I've seen in a long time. This is uh, from John Bolton. Uh, th this will be the first time in my uh, adult political career when I won't be voting for the Republican nominee for president. I won't be voting for Joe Biden either. Uh, I'll write in the name of a Republican conservative yet to be determined. Uh, but I'm very clearly of the view that uh, Donald Trump's not competent to be president. Uh, I don't think he's a philosophical conservative. He doesn't. <laughs> he's not up to the job. What? Yeah, says you. You know, I really just I love his like big sign of his book in the background there among among all of his like uh, diplomas or whatever it is, certificates of insanity. Um, I, I, I would love to see what those those certificates said. Like, you know, I, I wanted to bomb Iran and all I got was a certificate or something like that. Or, um, Who do you think he'll vote for? Psychopaths of America. I don't know. Dick Cheney. <laughs> I'm just curious who that who that person is now that the the conservative that Bolton can vote for. 
Right. Well, it's any of them. John McCain. I mean, honestly. <laughs> well, right. And W. I, where's right. W in all this? Uh, I didn't hear about him speaking at the DNC. What's up with that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Still got two nights. Stop. God, uh, Jamie, come spoiler on. Spoiler alert. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Oh, my bad. I'll tell it's you like something. a wrestler announcer <laughs> announcing Kissinger's coming up to the stage or something like that. No kidding. <laughs> I, you know what? I mean, that's the thing is that like you wonder like they're already at Colin Powell. What, what what's going to happen? I know John Kasich. Colin How are you going to top that? They had John McCain there mm. in, in death last night. McCain was rubbed all wow. over. That. Yep. They um, they they rubbed they rubbed him on themselves. Yep, John McCain was all, uh, they got all uh, rubbed up. All right, so Donald Laura Trump. Bush. I, I no. would watch that. One of the, um, one of the, the tactics they seem to be uh, deploying during this is that they really, and I think this is, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I can see the argument. If they can get Donald Trump um, to continue to say dumb things, that maybe, maybe that helps. I mean, you know, we'll 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 know in mid-November if this strategy works. And you know, uh, Ben Wickler, I think, was very instructive. The, there was a sense in that election from people I've talked to, particularly out of Wisconsin, that it was like a race to see who could lose less. Both candidates were disliked in a way that I don't know that we've ever had two major candidates who were disliked as much as that. And Joe Biden just simply is not as disliked as Hillary Clinton. It's just, it's just the case that he's not. And, you know, I don't know whether he should be or shouldn't be. Uh, I would imagine at least a percentage or a part of that is because he's a guy and uh, she's a woman. I yeah. Don't, you know. They're both terrible. Ergo sexism certainly plays a role. I mean, from my perspective, her policies were better. There's just her policies were better. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and I don't know if she would have enacted them, but yeah. like Medicare buy in at 55 instead of 60. I mean, you can go down the line. Her policies were better. Domestically, just, certainly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, but I, she has cankles. But yeah, I mean, I always thought like the, the Bernie would have won, but also I thought Biden would have won because Hillary was just so culturally toxic yes. <laughs> that like and you could ask anybody off the street what they thought about Hillary. And it's a good chance that they caught something and don't have a nice opinion of her. Yes. Yeah. 30 year campaign against her. Who yeah. would have thought? Right. And, and, and I think, um, you know, uh, like I say, Martin O'Malley, if we had a merch store, I would have had O'Malley would have won uh, T-shirts uh, printed up. But. You still can. But <laughs> they have it at the Democratic convention that the idea is to get under Trump's skin so that he says dumb things. And oh, no. He's never said anything dumb before. Well, you know, That's there have quite been the moments, novel strategy. There, there have been moments where Donald Trump like has like a week where he's calm and, you know, you feel like, wow, if he could maintain this, he'd be scary. He'd be scarier because if he continued with what he was doing in terms of like the policies and, and on the stupidity and he could just like chill, he could be scary. Cause you know, we, we've saw all those focus groups where the, where the right wingers like, I like everything he does, but the tweets seem a little bit much, that type of thing. So Michelle Obama quotes him saying uh, it is what it is. Right. Where everybody's like, you shouldn't say that about a pandemic. And I think he would probably, if he had the emotional ability to take it back and not and, and not have said that, he wouldn't have said it. But here's Donald Trump reacting to Michelle Obama, who went at Donald Trump. The Michelle Obama's speech last night where she said that you're in over your head and you're wrong. Yeah, no, she was over her head. And frankly, she should have made the speech live, which she didn't do. She taped it. And it was not only taped, it was taped a long time ago because she had the wrong deaths. She didn't even mention the vice presidential candidate uh, in the speech. And, you know, she gets these fawning reviews. If you gave a real review, it wouldn't be so fawning. I thought it was a very divisive speech, Thank extremely you. divisive. divisive. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for my campaign because of things like we're talking about now, drug prices and drug cuts and uh, transparency with hospitals and doctors that are going to lower 
bills by 50 percent, 70 percent. You're talking about numbers that are incredible. Uh, there's a procedure. I won't mention what it is. But there's a procedure where one hospital was charging $2,500, another hospital was charging $32 for the exact same procedure, using the exact same kit, and the people weren't able to go around and even have that option. And it was the exact same. In fact, we did a study, and the one for $32 actually did a better job. Okay? How about that? That's $2,500, $32, Didn't do a and the cheap one did a better job, using the exact same stuff. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about numbers that are incredible. No, I thought her speech was very divisive. And frankly, I wouldn't even be here if it weren't for Barack Obama. See, we're standing in the White House. I wouldn't be in the White House except for Barack Obama because they did a bad job, Biden and Obama. And if they did a good job, I wouldn't be here. I'd be building buildings someplace and having a good time. Oh, he really, she really did get under his skin. I love right? how many different examples of things he has to complain about. Like, she didn't live, she didn't have the right death numbers. It's much higher now. He didn't mention the VP. Uh, like, didn't even he, get close to how many people, just how many more people have died. It's yeah. actually 175 now. Yeah. Um, it's like, and it, it, he's briefing himself on this somehow. He's talking to this, talking to people about this. It reminds me of Way Nixon. Whenever, he, whenever Nixon finished a speech, half the Nixon types are Nixon calling people up and mm-hmm. asking them what they thought out of his speech like hey did it look how do you think it came over trump that's all trump spends his time on too all of it he's mad so mad and it's so clear i'm not even convinced that they didn't uh you know plant that question i'm impressed that he (laughs) was able to uh keep it together talking about hospitals for that long that's he made it like 50 seconds before his way swinging back yes Yes, but he did come back. Like, that's oh, God, his way yeah. of like, I'm not bothered by this at all, except for this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Let me prove to you I'm not bothered. Hey, what's going on over here? Right? $32? Anyways, she's a horrible human being. And I'm here, actually. Uh, Barack Obama screwed up. That's why I'm here. So, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> his life right is such that, a but... seamless extension of his Twitter persona. It's, it's amazing. It really I wish is. we could all be such fully integrated human beings. That's right. Here is Donald Trump now. And this post office thing has really blown. Let's do this. And then we will, uh, we'll talk about um, uh, Sager's thing. So here's Donald Trump. There has been an enormous amount of pressure brought to bear. I'm convinced by Republican lawmakers on DeJoy, the Postmaster General, and on Trump because they overplayed they overplayed their hand. They went in, and DeJoy just went in like a wrecking ball and um, uh, basically just hit something that was, you know, more or less a third rail. Again, the universality of the post office, the idea that you could be in a, uh, you know, East uh, or West, uh, you know, bum F um, and your mail is slowed down or you're in an urban, you know, bum F or wherever it is. The universality is what gives the post office its strength. Mm -hmm. Everybody relies on it. Everybody appreciates it. And um, that's when you get real a- action. And that's, uh, you know, that, that's a good lesson in durability. It's also a great lesson of, with the post office. It's also a great lesson in the idea of a service that is uh, at peak efficiency as defined by how many people it serves. Like if you want the post office to be really efficient, what you would do is what FedEx and UPS do, which is like, we're going to try and focus. We're not, there's some places we're not going to serve. Or if we serve, it's just going to be an extraordinary, ex- extraordinarily expensive. Or if we serve it, it's going to take much longer to deliver there because it's just not economically efficient for us to do this. What the post office shows is that what government agencies should do is not focus on what is economically efficient, what's going to drive profit, but what is going to provide as much service for as many people, if not all the people as possible. 
So that stamp cost, job number one is getting the letter there. For a private enterprise, job number one is profit. And then everything else is how do you maintain profit and grow profit? And yes, we've got to do good things. We've got to make it look like we're, you know, we care about this, or we've got to provide this type of customer service, but it's to maintain profit and having that profit, whether it's, you know, this part of, uh, you know, the whole or what um, is what keeps it from serving all the people. Yeah, Here's well, Donald Trump. There's no right to mail, though. You there's want no. mail in a rural area? You get a job and you pay for it. Yeah, well, exactly. Right. We never hear that. We never hear that. You never hear. I mean, there may be some libertarians say that. They say the same thing about roads, too. Uh, here's Trump explaining that um, how he'd save the post office from maybe from him. What we do is it's price per package. And they haven't figured exactly whether it's two dollars or three dollars. And you make it so Amazon has to pay and they can't pass it on. They make a lot of money. They can't pass it on to their customer. Right now, Amazon comes in, they build their big plant and they deliver the easy ones and the hard ones they give to the post office. And the plant is usually right next to a big post office building or a post office. They dump packages into the post office. We, the United States, delivers the package for Amazon and we lose a lot of money. Unacceptable. And I've been telling these people to do that. That is not true. I mean, we do deliver, the post office does do the last mile essentially for, uh, for Amazon a lot of times. But I, my understanding is that there is no service that the post office can offer that will lose money for, in that instance. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case. I think he's just like mad at Amazon. The funny thing is that all the people he's putting in there are basically invested in Amazon. If, if Trump hates uh, Jeff Bezos so much, it'd be nice if Jeff Bezos wasn't incredibly uh, and significantly richer than he started this pandemic out with. Maybe you should right. do something about that. Here's yeah. an idea. You really want to get at Bezos? Support Bernie Sanders' wealth tax that he proposed for billionaires who have made uh, over a billion dollars during this pandemic. 60%. 60% of that wealth accumulated during this pandemic if you made over a billion dollars. That's right. Support a wealth tax to own the libs. There you go. Exactly. Get get Bezos. Tax him. Is there any more to this? Or is it just more of the same? For Amazon, and we lose a lot of money. Unacceptable. And I've been telling these people to do this for the last three years. But they just got the board, and we're going to be doing it. Amazon is going to pay for the post office. Amazon's going to pay for the post office. How about we just tax Amazon? I mean, great. Yeah, make Amazon pay for the post office. There's a simple way to do that. Exactly. What is that butt rock music playing in the background? I couldn't really tell. That's CCR. I think it's, uh, yeah, that's CCR. Uh, I, it, yeah, some folks were born, made that song, whatever. Ooh, the red, white, and blue. Fortunate um, Son. Can, oh, oh <laughs> okay. Are they playing Fortunate I, Son? Yeah. Yeah, Fortunate Son. Yeah. He, it, irony is completely lost on Trump. <laughs> oh yeah wow this is this is just uh this reminded me like the way trump turned that into an alternate apprentice pitch for the post office <laughs> instead of you know actually attacking base that's reminded me of this vic Berger uh, edit but <laughs> now that's changed <laughs> today through the shopper image you can enjoy the world's greatest steaks in your own home with family friends anytime and you're going to finally have the affordability they need and the quality <laughs> they deserve at a lower price trump <laughs> Yeah, right. He's just like throwing in all those words. Nice. Uh, I take it back. Me. That was a perfect song. 317 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello? 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 Is this the Sam Cedar show? Yes, this it is. This is Sam Cedar. I can't believe I have to call into my own goddamn show. I've been trying to talk to my lawyer all morning, and the technology is absolutely failing. John from San Antonio has wrecked my in-ear monitors with his fuzzy microphone. Lucy keeps bombing our Zoom meetings, asking at the lawyer's office, is, is the AM quickie? And, and Jamie and Nomi Key, 
keep bugging me for product. <laughs> they keep asking if they, if they can have some liquid IV and sunset like CBD. When all I'm trying to do is speak to my attorney about my ongoing lawsuit against MSNBC because they refuse to air my opinions regarding the tyrannical behavior of my new local water commission. I've been assessed a punitive fee for installing 14 Hello Tushy bidets in one household, and there is absolutely no legal language in the municipal code limiting the number of aftermarket ass cleaners. Look, we just have a lot of pooping, what with all the just coffee and the magic spoon. I have to be able to properly clean my cookies in every room in the household, plus the attic in the basement as a makeshift studio. And this water commissioner is insisting I pay an additional $37 on my bill for these added fixtures? He's a madman, an absolute fascist. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the call. That was pretty good. Yeah. That was pretty good. You, you got contacted thought, from an alternate dimension, an I honestly alternate you. It was the, the, I mean, the guy nailed the jerky boys thing. Big time. Mm -hmm. Calling from a 732 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. Is this me? Yeah, it is. Who's this? Hey, um, I'm a 26-year-old letter carrier from New Jersey. Uh, I don't want to say my name on air. Okay, no, I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't want you to either. Okay, a 26-year-old letter carrier from New Jersey. Outline. Yeah, uh, thank, well, go thank, ahead. Thank you, I've got some, um, I got some questions for you, but you, you tell me. You, you, you say what you got to say first, but I got some questions for you. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I just want to say thank you guys so much. Um, you and uh, CNBS for um, all your coverage. Um, it's super, super um, awesome to hear, and uh, we really appreciate it. So, okay. What measures, the, the measures that are being taken, um, how long have they been in the works, and, and do you see them, and is the mail being delayed? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you asked that. So I have not seen any of these changes in my office. Um, matter of fact, I've been working more overtime than I have since I started about four years ago. Wow. Um, so the initiatives that um, just got rolled back that were put into place only hit, as far as I know, certain post offices. It was like a rollout initiative that was going to take place in certain stations, um, to see how they would work. And our office was not one that got hit. Um, in my office, as far as I know, and I've been working six days a week, we haven't left any mail. If there's a vacant route, we deliver it that day. So people who work overtime, we all split the route. We get the work done. Now, I know people in other offices, and that's not the case. So it's definitely happening. I just haven't experienced it. And, and you've, you've, but you've talked to other letter carriers who have been part of that pilot program, I guess. And uh, yeah. So, okay. So part of it is no overtime. Right. And uh, so you can't deal with sort of like surges in mail as it were. Part of it is that you need to go out and do your route regardless of it. There's mail to be sorted and, uh, and sent out. And that, that's what, that's what, that's why sometimes my, letter carrier will come at 11 a.m. and sometimes they'll come at 1 p.m. is because there may be extra mail and they don't want to leave the office without having uh, all the mail that, that could be delivered delivered. Yes, we do. We usually do about anywhere from 30 to an hour uh, worth of work in the office before we take our mail and our packages from the route out to the street. Um, one thing I can say is um, you know, I'm very involved in the union, and I'm very um, up to date on um, what we can do and what we're not allowed to do regarding our contract. So just because our office isn't delaying mail doesn't mean that the supervisors will, you know, they'll try to do anything they can to, you know, fudge the time clock numbers to make it seem like you're out on the road, you know, when you're still in the office at 9 o'clock. Um, so they can say things like, hey, um, you know, while you're digging the small parcels out of your bin um, to sort them in route order, um, head out to the street for me. You know, they're really coming down hard on us to make sure that office times are short. The problem with that is you're showing that you left the office at 830 when you really didn't leave the office till nine o'clock. And that is incentive for upper management to start 
adding to your route. And then you have an eight hour route that you're probably overburdened with anyway during the pandemic because parcels are out of control. Um, and so it, it, that's, that's the one thing that I have noticed in my office. But again, if you know your contract and you have good, um, a good shop steward in your office, you can bring that to their attention and, and, and put a stop to that re- really quick. Um, oh, all right, uh, so let me you ask know, you this. When, when Donald sure, Trump says uh, that you guys deliver the Amazon packages, right? You do deliver some of the last, last mile or whatever it is, uh, essentially, uh, for the Amazon packages. Are they done? Is that at a loss? Um, so as far as I know, we don't lose any money on the Amazon deliveries. Um, like you guys have been state, like, you know, we, we've been talking about this, you know, the past month. Like the Postal Service is the United States Postal Service. We're not here to make a killing on these packages. We make a profit on these packages. But as far as I know, we don't lose any money from the Amazon service whatsoever. Um, let me ask you, what have you heard anything about the sorting machines? Um, yeah, only for what, what I'm reading in the news is that okay. basically um, maybe a couple hundred, I believe, um, of the big letter sorting machines have been pulled out. Um, that's millions of dollars worth of equipment, which is um, crazy because the whole opposition's argument is we're not able to handle the volume and it's going to be a mess. And, you know, that one, that's not true with or without the machines. This is our job. Our network has been doing this for hundreds of years and we have the technology and the manpower to do it. Um, so those machines are being pulled out. Um, apparently that those initiatives have stopped, um, until November 3rd. Um, and that's all I really know about the machine, okay. but yeah, that, uh, that is true. And, uh, I, 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 it's been my sense that the, the, the post office boxes, I guess this in, or, you know, in Portland or something being removed, that seems to me to be fairly, um, fairly routine. Is that right? That is correct. Um, the Postal Service uh, does these um, mail counts in the, those blue boxes that you see all over town. Um, so when the letter carrier um, goes and picks it up on one month when district decides to run a test, we'll count the pieces of mail. And that's to just determine, like, hey, is this box being used? Can right. we move this box to another location? Can we just consolidate two boxes within, like, a mile radius and just have one box? That's very normal. Okay. Um, yeah. Anything else we should know? Um, uh, that's about it. Um, I just want to say, uh, again, thanks for your coverage. It's awesome. Thank you for having uh, lead, uh, union leadership on. We really appreciate all the work you guys do. Um, one last thing I'll say is you and Michael Brooks saved me from the red pill nonsense and uh, really got me uh, to think critically about things. And um, if you guys are ever discouraged about, you know, the dumb arguments and things like that that you hear all the time from right wing nut jobs. Um, don't because you guys are um, you guys are doing an awesome job and it's working. So thank you so much for all your work. Thank Heck you. Yeah. I really thank appreciate you. that. And thanks for uh, for the work you're doing. Uh, uh, I know letter carriers are going through <laughs> a ton of crap through this. I appreciate it. Hang in there. Yeah, I, I would. Thank you so you, much, Dan. Take care, wait, everyone. Can I, but, 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 never mind. <laughs> I was going to ask uh, if he has any ideas for what kind of labor action could help in this situation, because uh, as we all know, direct action gets the goods and the U.S. Postal Service itself, as we covered, as you covered so well the other day with uh, Mr. Diamondstein, was created originally as the result of a massive wildcat strike by the postal workers in 1970. Yep. Um. Hello, Sam. Urgent. Please read on your show. Y'all are amazing at calling out white supremacy, imperialism, and capitalism, but can we hear more shout outs denouncing patriarchy? Uh, lots of my hetero cis male friends tune into your show and look up to you and need to hear it out loud. Love you, Sam. Um, yeah. Okay. Down with the patriarchy. I cannot do the Sam voice for shit. I'm sorry. I'm working on it. Next time that person calls back in, down with the patriarchy. Um, this is uh, this is bizarre. 
Um, here's Brian Kilme, who thinks that, and part of this, to be fair, is a function of some bad reporting that took place by NBC. It is, and like, this is something, you know, we mentioned earlier that I found the going around with the, the parties, the states, representative from the state saying, you know, we give 30 delegates to Bernie Sanders and 50 delegates to the next president of the United States, Joe Biden. That was a very different experience, both watching on TV or in person, than it would have been when you do it on the, from the floor of a convention. And on the floor of a convention, nobody pays attention. Nobody can do any, like, there's, they're, they're, they're not in the context. You don't get a sense of who it is. You, you get none of it. Same thing when, when you have a convention where there are two uh, people who have a significant amount of delegates, this is, this, is comp this is always done this way. It's just that it doesn't appear this way because in this instance, it was virtual. So AOC got up there. She nominated Bernie Sanders. Um, I didn't think it was necessarily one of her best speeches, but whatever. It was, it was a very narrowly tailored speech uh, because she was up there um, she, it was her job to nominate a Bernie Sanders. That was what her job was. I don't know if she decided to do that because maybe it was like, Oh, I don't have to give a full throated endorsement to Joe Biden in that moment or, or what, but this was what her job was in the context of this thing. And people blew it up. Like, she got up there and just sort of freelanced and didn't say anything about Biden and ended up endorsing Bernie Sanders. This was all supposed to happen this way. And here is Brian Kilmeade who sees something very different going on. And one of the biggest stories has to be AOC coming out and endorsing Bernie Sanders in a minute when she looked like a hostage video. Uh, it is unbelievable because it looks like there's an agenda trying to get out with Bernie Sanders leading off day one and AOC with her held to one minute speech endorsing Bernard Sanders right after. And the theory is, and it's hard to push it down, that once Joe Biden's elected, this party's going flying left. And it's when this, when things like that happen and you see someone like AOC with the social media rock store she is, basically That's saying cool. everything bad about the country, where she wants to take it and what Bernie Sanders would do for it, uh, bad combination. Meanwhile, John, I don't. What does he I mean? It's a hostage theory. video. Well, first of all, <laughs> it's a hostage video because it's on video. But and she endorsed Bernie. Bernie. So like, wouldn't they like, hostage. wouldn't they kill her? Like, no, I think in this scenario, she is the jailer making a video about the hostage that she is holding, a.k.a. Who? Joe Biden. Joe Biden. I don't think I think yeah. we have three different theories about who the hostage and who the who's holding the, the hostage. Here. The, the, none of his theory there. You could you cannot track what he was saying. Love to map his that out. No, was, it's a hostage like, video. It, it started out like he was she was like a hostage video is she's being forced to endorse Bernie Sanders. But 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 she was not in the but hostage. Wouldn't she be say, forced to endorse Biden? Exactly. No, no, he's Bernie's hostage. A hostage video no, but, is when the jailer gets on the camera and says, I'm holding some hostages. Here's the video. But 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 here's the thing. If she's holding if she's held being held hostage by Bernie or Biden, like it doesn't make sense that her hostage video is indicative of the fact of how much power Bernie and AOC have yeah. within the party. And let's be clear here. Bernie gave, Bernie was number two in the delegate count. He gave a four or five minute speech. And then she had one minute out of the 120 minutes, like Eva Lagaria or whatever her name is. She, oh yeah, she wasn't the host last night. Who, I don't know the name of the host. Who was the host last night? I don't know. N Both of them had more speaking time than AOC did, which of course is indicative of their secret plan, which is to give the party over to her. 
after this oh, election is over. They're holding her hostage and then they're going to give her the keys. Like, I, I don't. This is the it's, most confusing metaphor I've ever heard. In my it's life. the reverse. Um, what do you call it? What is the, the, the syndrome that you get? It's the reverse Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome. They're holding her hostage and they are beginning to sympathize with her. Oh. And that's why they give her the party afterwards. Yeah, that's or it's how like, powerful she is. It's like Herman Melville's Benito Serino, which is about like <laughs> all the slaves had taken over the, the slave master ship and they were under control of the slaves, but they couldn't. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's a bit far field. Mm. That's a little far. It's, it's a, bla- it's a, it's a blazing saddle syndrome. It's What's the, the blazing saddle paradox, I think. Um, <laughs> that is that is impressive. They are so desperate to try and shoehorn this thing in there. And I, I don't know. They did it very quickly. But look, it's not just Brian Kilmeade. Brian Kilmeade has this bizarre uh, theory that there's going to be a um, AOC, a uh, Bernie Sanders takeover based upon the fact that they're holding her hostage or she's holding them hostage or she's got superpowers or whatever it is. If it was just Brian Kilmeade, then, you know, who would worry? But it's not just Brian Kilmeade. Because Ainsley Earhart also has a theory. If you look at Bernie, uh, it's or if you look at Biden, it's interesting. He's more like Bernie, she's saying, than he is like Barack. All these Bs. You yeah. got Bernie and Biden and Barack. Uh, but sh- but I think he has to be in order to appeal to the progressives. And the progressives are saying, hey, we tried to win with Bernie. That didn't work. So let's get into Washington with Biden, who is establishment, who is a lot, who has a lot of experience touts himself as more moderate, right. he'll appeal to that base, and then we will bring in all the progressives, then eventually what we stand for. You know, remember... Let's remember, just get in the door. Let's get in the door, and then we can infiltrate Washington and infiltrate the country. And remember when Bernie was running and he said, I'm socialist, everyone said, what? <laughs> Do you understand what that means? And then slowly but surely, more and more people <laughs> liked his message. They this did. Is how it starts. <laughs> and, you know, it's just uh, it's amazing, it too, because he was about to win the nomination and Jim Clyburn and the establishment stopped him in his tracks in South Carolina. Bernie. And Bernie, uh, he had it locked up. He was obviously doing better, a much better campaigner, a much better debater because he knows his issues. He never puts any of his ideas into practice, never worked in Vermont, never passed anything in, con- <laughs> in the Senate, but he memorizes textbooks. Let me say one thing, Brian. Being from <laughs> South Carolina, I still think that Biden would have gotten the nomination. Clyburn helps. But I still think he right. would have because they love Barack Obama. Um, Ooh, take that, Kilmeade. Wow. Uh, uh, they, they are so, I mean, this is just, it's fascinating how they cannot even within the context of like a two minute clip, maintain a consistent narrative. The, a, the problem with socialism is that when people hear about it, they start to like it. That's one of the things that she's worried about. Uh, the other the other issue apparently is, is that when the, the progressives s- settled on Joe Biden because they couldn't get Bernie. And so they were like, well, we can just get in there anyways without him and we'll infiltrate Washington and the country. I mean, I hope she's right. Um, I don't I don't put a lot of stock in that, but I hope she's right. I mean, she's more optimistic than I am. Opportunity. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be some opportunity, I think. Uh, uh... For the left. I think I mean, it'll be good to have like trillions of dollars spent to the Green New Deal that wouldn't otherwise be there. Like things like that will be nice. But as far as like the left organizing it, sign it. Oh, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think his his deal, the one that the one that he's he's it won't be the full Green New Deal. Yeah, but it'll be like, you know, one he rolled out. I think he will sign. I mean, that's preferable to. I mean, but I don't know. That's like that's good for environmentalists. Like, and it's good. It's better for the left that the um, world burns a little bit slower. But well, if you want to get granular about the Green New Deal, I think it's been widely agreed upon by climate scientists that just doing these half measures is not is is about as bad as doing nothing at all in terms of our long term climate viability. But I guess that's a. it's getting a bit far afield here. Uh, I like how she acts like uh, they say Bernie couldn't get anything passed in Vermont, and yet he's got the power and the organizational skills and the sneakiness to like somehow infiltrate the Democratic Party. Well, part of the reason why he couldn't get anything passed in Vermont was because he was a federal senator and not involved in Vermont politics. I mean, he was a Burlington mayor. He was the mayor. 
but you can't, that's not the way it works. You can't pass legislation in Burlington that controls the entire state. But putting that aside, um, they, they are just desperately struggling to figure out how they deal with Joe Biden. It's so second order, right? It's not even, it is, you cannot let Joe Biden in because he cracks open the door for the socialists. It's not, there's, there's no first order issue they have with Biden. It's fascinating. Yeah, well, I hope that they're right. I hope they're right too. Yeah, so all I uh, Here's Brian Kilmeade talking about, I know we're doing a lot of Fox and Friends, but they were particularly stupid today. Uh, we got, we got, um, here's Brian Kilmeade basically arguing the absolute opposite of what we were arguing about the postal service. The postal service is not there to make a profit. The postal service is there to make sure that people, whether you are in the smallest town in uh, North Dakota or the biggest city in the country, whether you're on the, the north or the south or the east or the west, you put a uh, stamp on that mail and it will get delivered as fast as possible and consistently as possible. And if you're ordering chickens or you're ordering a tractor part or you're ordering a new blender or whatever it is, it's going to get mailed to you. If you send in a letter and you want to send it overseas, it will get delivered. The postal service is just a bedrock of communication and consistency. And that's what the purpose of it is. But kill me, has a different idea. I call on Nancy Pelosi to not only finally fix the post office, but let's find the things that are hurting Americans across the country because of this pandemic. Let's pass a skinny bill. We'll be here on Saturday. Hopefully they will with a negotiating heart. Yeah, maybe see the Senate might help too. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, the business model doesn't work. It's no one's fault. It doesn't work. It doesn't mean your post letter carrier's lazy or some people, they're not bad people. It doesn't work. So it's got to be fixed. And I know... Yeah, the business model actually works. The problem is, is that they don't allow the post office to raise the cost of stamps to where it will provide that service. The business model has worked for, I don't know, as long as probably any business that has been in existence in uh, this country. Yeah, and it's not even supposed to be a business. It's a service. Right, exactly. Exactly. And then Mark Meadows, of course, is is um, is basically letting you know what their strategy is. Well, now that there's a public outcry over the post office, we're going to use that as a way of pride, putting a Band-Aid on the coronavirus relief. I hope the Democrats don't fall. Don't fall into this trap because they're basically they have leverage. They have a little bit of leverage and they need to use it. They need to get. Uh, support for schools. They need to get support for states. They need to get support for cities. They obviously need to get uh, 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 unemployment insurance extended. They need to get more money directly to people. But the the Republicans want to do that too. What they don't want to do is the state and city funding because this, it is the perfect sort of like time delayed bomb for the Republicans. Because if you underfund the state and cities, their fiscal crisis happens in late October. And the implications of it go go deep into this year and really come into the Q1 of next year. And that's where the states get hammered. That's where the economy goes to the tubes, down the tubes. And so the Republicans are like, well, let's wait and see if we win the election. And we'll do something for those city and states if we have to, uh, particularly the, the uh, red ones. But that's that's the name of this game. I, I, I mean, it's it's so obvious. I cannot imagine that. Pelosi and Schumer don't realize this, but if they don't, boy, oi. Um, oh, so. I don't understand, like they're, they're so desperate. The right now to make this about the culture war, they really have nothing else to talk about. And uh, really, the culture war, we know, 
is just another way of saying white culture. And in many respects, over the years, it's also meant white patriarchal culture. Um, we saw this back in 92. There we go. Down with the patriarchy. Boom. 92, where, you know, you had like Dan Quayle talking about, this is going to sound bizarre to all of you. Dan Quayle attacked Murphy Brown for having a child out of wedlock. Do you know who Murphy Brown is? TV show. I'm not as young as you think I am, Sam. It is. It was a TV show. My Where parents I, uh, totally used to watch that when I was a kid. A single Bro. parent. She was she was a reporter or a journalist or something like that. And it's always the messages that you get from the music or the TV. Like the, this, this, this sitcom is teaching people the wrong lesson that you can have a child out of wedlock. Or maybe this music is destroying our culture. Like, for instance, this uh, WAP controversy that uh, Ben mm -hmm. Shapiro introduced us to, where like people are hearing that women can actually get pleasure having sex and it's not a function of a yeast infection. Who knew? This is coming as very disturbing um, news to people like Ben Shapiro and, of course, Tucker Carlson. To give you a sense of what this song is about, and again, we should tell you this is one of the most popular songs in the country, and you need to go online and look up its lyrics. Here's the woman who sings it, Cardi B, explaining to women how they can become more useful sex objects. Watch. I like you the damn dry ass because your pH balance is off. And you want to know why? It's not because you're born with it. It's because y'all keep these dirty ass. You got to tell, babe, yo, your d more like mustard. My d won't throw my pH balance off. Y'all be these little dirty ass. Y'all be they d and shit. Y'all need to brush your teeth before you eating barbecue ribs the whole day, bacon, egg, and cheese. Then you eat a d right after. Put it inside your d. Now you got bacon, egg, and cheese grease inside your You know what I'm saying? That's garbage. Uh, you don't need to be a Puritan to think so. It is. It's garbage. Uh, it's aimed at like young Puritan. American girls, maybe your girls, your granddaughters. And what is it doing to them? Can you even imagine? Pause what it it's for doing a second. To them? Hold on for one People second. Are, Pause it for a second. Before we. <laughs> what, but, oh, is that, is that it? There's like five seconds left. The First of all, there is the idea that anybody watching Fox News understood anything that she was yeah. saying. <laughs> Right. Like, like, like I only caught like the last part because there's so many beeps there that they're just they're, uh, really what they're just saying is like, look at this black woman who is talking about. I mean, and, and for what I gather, like apparently and I don't know if this is actually a problem, but something about like where if you've had uh, greasy food and then you orally uh, copulate with your boyfriend and then your boyfriend uh, or girl, or, you know, boyfriend, I guess, um, uh, copulates with your vagina, then the greasy food ends up in your vagina. Now, I do think that that is, um, I appreciate that Cardi B is telling people you should not have greasy. First of all, you shouldn't eat, you shouldn't be eating that greasy food in the first place. Uh, but secondly, you don't want that in your vagina or uh, on your penis. Uh, but this is a real problem for uh, Tucker Carlson. He's very concerned. You remember when he was complaining about people smoking pot? Do you remember that? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Like, talking about like everybody's getting high. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. You know, um, you know what it reminds me of? Like, let me just tell you like how old this is. This is so old. This is what, this is the definition of a reactionary, right? Where it's like, he is basically just imposing the, the same old, oppressive structures this woman this black woman she's oversexed it is a problem she needs to stop being so popular she needs to stop being so sexualized she needs to stop being so black on television and talking to people yeah and the implicit part is she needs to stop talking about politics because she's an incredibly skilled communicator yep and she's and actually making a difference out there I just want to remind people that this is like, give you a sense of just how hip Tucker Carlson is. Um, do we have that clip 
of uh, of the Ed Sullivan show, the first this is the first time that Elvis Presley was on television. If I remember correctly, I wasn't alive. Uh, and I, maybe I was live. I'm not sure. Here, put this on. Now, what they've done here is they are shooting him from, uh, for the most part, from the waist up, I think it was. They, um, I don't know if this is the one where they, they, they. This they might have been the him. scandalous one that they, oh, they showed. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, they were afraid because he was moving his uh, groin around in such it's, a way that was similar all over the place. to you don't, uh, copulation. You don't need to be a Puritan to think that's disgusting. It's disgusting. How can they have him on TV? <laughs> he is one of the most, most uh, popular musicians in the world. Do you want your boys and girls to see that? My mm-hmm. God. Disgusting. It, you know what else? Like, why is he attacking Cardi B? Why isn't he attacking any of the men who objectify women? Why does he only have a problem with a woman when she's talking about her own body? Hmm? Exactly. Of course. And here he is. They, this time they shot him. Uh, maybe this is the first time they shot him right up close. So they don't see what he's doing with his groin. Mm. <laughs> That's disgusting. much better. Absolutely disgusting. You can My still God. see it in his eyes. Yep. You can see that WAP look in his eyes it's, right it's there. It's worse to imagine what's going on out of frame. Um, Get a bucket and a mop. This is uh, pretty uh, impressive. Um, wait, was it? when was this footage? Is this from 2019? The uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have some footage. This is, to be fair, to be fair, this was a year ago. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she has uh, won her um, primary. Where is she in Georgia? Yeah, 14th. Georgia's 14th uh, district. She will more than likely be the next congressperson from Georgia's 14th district. And just to get a sense of, um, you know, what her mission is all about. Here she is on Capitol Hill in 2019. Um. As you know, or may not know, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib are uh, Muslims. They took their oath on the Quran because (gasps) they don't subscribe to the Christian Bible. And so if they were to take their oath on the Christian Bible, it wouldn't really mean much. I don't know that it means much to do it on any religious document, but it's just what we do in our tradition, blah, 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 because God is really paying attention to these oaths. Uh, but here is uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, in Washington trying to right that deep, deep wrong. They signed it. They swore in on the Korean Oh, we have the Bible. We're going to talk about swearing in on the oath, how to swear in on the Bible with them mm-hmm. and let them know what our law says, yes. that you can't swear in on the Quran. So we're going, to, we're going to explain that. You know, we're going to explain about how you can't swear in on the Quran, and we're yeah. going to have the Bible and ask them if they would swear in on the Bible, mm-hmm. that we really need we them. We have the oath. Yeah, we have the oath. Yep. So I think no, that's important. The sad thing is, now that you're, you're infringing on our religion, you're infringing on our religion yes. by saying that okay. we can't swear in <laughs> But when Thanks they swore in, it wasn't a law yet, right? So, at the time yeah. they swore in. I don't know. I think at the time they swore in, that wasn't passed. Yeah. Because Just Because idiots. it wouldn't have been passed in a Republican control. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it was passed after they swore in. So they're not really official, I don't think. So let's go ask them to swear in in the Bible, because like you said, Will, I'm... Does it have to be the Holy Bible? Yeah, it has to be the Bible. Well, the bottom line is Sharia law law is not compatible with with America. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, oh, that's the bottom line. line. Of the Constitution? Say you represent women, but you support Sharia law. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, Got her ass. Damn, I want that guy to call it. I think we need corrected. Uh, One... If you swore in on the Quran and there was a law that was passed subsequent to that, that you need to swear in on the Bible, I suspect that you would still be okay. You would be grandfathered in. But 
one should also know there is no law that you need to be sworn in on the Bible. Uh, so none of that is uh, relevant. What is amazing to me is how, how, um, how fervently these people hang on to beliefs and don't do any research whatsoever. Like well, you could actually look up and see that, oh, wait, there is no law. Well, there should be. And I'm still going to go anyways for this documentary I'm shooting. And then at the end, they just said, well, the bottom line is Sharia is incompatible with the Constitution. I mean, I don't know. Is Kashrut uh, compatible with the Constitution? There's a whole bunch of things that aren't necessarily compatible with the Constitution. And that's why uh, more often than not, the Constitution carries the day. I would love uh, the Constitution to certainly carry the day. We have this uh, push by uh, Donald Trump and the uh, Supreme Court to do religious freedom laws, which, you know, would allow like a pharmacist to say, like, I don't believe in contraception. Or let's say an employer to say, like, I don't want uh, my uh, employees to get free, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, contraception or uh, abortions from their insurer because I don't, I, my money's fungible. I don't like that. I mean, so, um, and then of course they don't practice Sharia law. So none of what they said, none of it was even remotely close to being like the case. And they could still be doing their same freaking insanity, but just like know what they're talking about. Well, I think they do do their research. They just don't read the same websites as us. What, but what website is saying you need, there's a law? Like, you know what? You, if you wanted to find out if there's a law that was passed that said you need to take the oath on a Bible, you could look up at yeah, like you the go register to or, or, tell or, you. or you go to facebook.com and find some groups among some people that can help be your research buddies and you mm -hmm. can come to these conclusions together. Mm -hmm. oh, do a little go. reading group together, even. <laughs> or maybe Get educated. QAnon has their own. QAnon's got to set up their mm -hmm. own research system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, these people are just jealous. Like, if anyone's trying to do Sharia law, it's them. Let's go to the uh, phones, shall we? Call from a 920 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, this is Joe from Wisconsin. Joe from Wisconsin. What's on your mind? Um, yeah, with all of the uh, word, uh, gosh darn it, I'm getting all flustered. Um, <laughs> uh, with everything that's being done to suppress the vote, the uh, attacks on the post office and that, can you imagine if those things were being done by a party that you supported or for purposes you supported? You know, if they were being done to help people, can you still imagine being willing to suppress the vote like that? Um, I'm not sure I totally follow what you're saying. If the majority of people didn't believe that, Things should be better for people and, you know, thing and we should support Medicare for all and, you know, more services than that. But there was a party in power that did want to do those things and wanted to stay in power to continue doing those things and were, and you agreed with them, but were doing things that were anti-democratic. Would you still would would you support those anti-democratic measures if you thought that those helped people? Um, I, I mean, in all honesty, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I mean, I need more specific things, but in the main, I would, I, I can't imagine a scenario where I would be, um, where I would be, uh, uh, you know, would be on board for vote suppression. Uh, I'm trying to think of like something like, I, I don't know, um, 
Well, I mean, I, I mean, for the most part, no, it's just a hard scenario to imagine because I think for the most part, um, the whole point of, of like these specific issues is that it is, they are an expression of what would be more democratic in, in small d democratic insofar as that like, you know, this is for the benefit of, of, of more people, not less. And so like broadly speaking, like the, 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 the issue sets that I support are sort of foundationally more pro democratic small d so i don't know that's a hard scenario i'm just trying to come uh, figure out what it would be like i don't know i'm afraid to answer this question because i feel like we're being led into a trap i I, i'm 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 honestly not trying to trap you it's it's actually something that i kind of uh struggle with as i am in a i'm in an area with a lot of people and I am like actively political and a lot of them aren't. And it's really hard to like push against those kind of like uh, inclinations. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I mean, you're, you know, it's like, yes, it's very tempting. You're in an area that is uh, heavily Republican to uh, not say like, Oh yeah. You know, make sure you vote on Wednesday you know, as, as opposed to Tuesday. Like, yeah, I understand that impetus. And I, I, I you know, I, um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I need, you know, in, in this specific moment, but I would say this, I'm not, I wouldn't rule it out. I wouldn't rule it out that I would do something, uh, um, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to come up with a scenario, but I don't, I don't think, I, I think it would be, it would be nice for me to say that I would definitely, you know, in every circumstance be, uh, I always choose the more democratic small D, um, approach, uh, even if it meant that, uh, issues that I thought were really important didn't get, I mean, but you know, let's say, I don't know, in the context of, uh, the, the war in Iraq, the vast majority of people, the vast, but the, the certainly the majority of people were in favor of, of an invasion and an attack on Iraq. And if I had a, um, a mechanism in which to prevent that uh, war from happening, that was, I, I don't know what it would be, but it was, uh, you know, arguably in principle, anti-democratic. I, I think I'd be inclined to, to do that anyways. So I, you know, I don't know, but I appreciate I've, the call. I thought here. about this a little bit myself. I would say, uh, socialism on the whole is a more small d democratic system than the one that we have now. Uh, and almost, right? I mean, it's definitionally. yeah, yeah. And in order to get to there, um, sure. I think bourgeois electoral politics, like we talk about every day can play a role, but at a certain point in time, you're going to have to overcome them and go past them. So in that sense, I guess, uh, yeah, but it's hard for me to envision a scenario because socialism has to come from below in order to be worth anything at all, right? In order to be worth the name. So I cannot imagine a situation in which a real democratic socialism is somehow imposed from above without the wider support of the population. Now, whether or not that maps onto a bourgeois election that is run based on the rules that the ruling class wrote is a separate issue. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm hesitant to say never say, you know, I'm hesitant to say never say never. All right. One, uh, one final call and then we'll do some IMs so we get to get out of here. Call from a four, three, four area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Andy pants. Andy pants. What's on your mind? Uh, not much. Um, I'm so I'm a 33 year old, uh, DSA member from Connecticut. Um, uh, I live in Cheshire. I was calling because this is a couple of weeks old, but um, I'm so happy that the DSA did not endorse Joe Biden because of the mockery of the whole um, the convention, and it would have just it would have just deterred the younger people that are that are getting more involved in the socialist and communist movements um, by by like you know. Um, if they had endorsed Joe Biden, I feel like it would have turned so many people off. 
from like new membership. I don't know if that, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. And then I have a, I have another point, which is a quick song, which is based off of your intro music and it's for Jamie, but I want to sing Aww. it. Best <laughs> uh, why don't you sing it now quickly and then uh, we'll answer your question. <laughs> Take as much time okay, as you so. want. Gotta be quick. Gotta be quick. <laughs> no, it's real quick. It's real quick. It goes, <laughs> the alpha males are back, back, back. Jamie's bangs are back, back, back. Ah! Just, just, just Jamie in the Mets, Mets, Mets. <laughs> Jamie in the match, match, okay, match. all right. All right. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's Thank you guys. I love you. Okay, yep. Uh, thanks for staticky. noticing. I was getting a little staticky. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I personally think that, look, as an institution, you have a responsibility to weigh um, what imparting, well, you know, whether it's part of your mission to endorse in this instance, and also, even if, if and then if you decide it's not part of our mission to endorse, um, except for in very narrow circumstances, that makes it easy. And then even if you think it's within your mission, maybe to endorse, you've got to make uh, you've got to make a calculation. Does how much does this hurt the organization? And frankly, this is the amazing thing. Every day, politicians make these decisions. You know, why didn't Bernie endorse this candidate in New Mexico? Why didn't L Elizabeth Warren endorse that candidate in New York? Whatever it is, they make a calculation. And, and this happens with all other politicians, but just in our world, that's what we talk about more. All politicians, any organization makes these calculations all the time all the time, even if they want them to win. It's a question of like, wait, does this going to hurt me more than it's going to help them? And if it hurts me more than it helps them, maybe it's not worth it. Because the fact of the matter is, is that like the DSA, not as a, you know, as a stated goal, but the DSA is going to help Joe Biden win more than it hurts Joe Biden chances of winning because they're going to go out and they're going to bring people out to vote for candidates who are running from people who might otherwise not be voting. And when they get in that voting booth, the odds are they're going to pull the lever for Joe Biden. And so you're going to get votes that you wouldn't otherwise have gotten. I don't know how many it will be or this and that, but if you disempower the, uh, the DSA by having to endorse somebody who is not within their mission, essentially, you're not helping anything. It's just a question of like, it's just, it's just performative for yeah. the endorsee. Yeah. Yeah. This I should, I should mention the DSA doesn't do paper endorsements at this point in time. So when we endorse somebody, we don't just say that we like that person. We actually devote a lot of resources mm. to helping that person's campaign. And I think most people in the DSA agree that our resources would be better spent elsewhere. Yeah. Similarly, on the, the convention things, like it's hard for me to get too bent out of shape that the Democrats didn't like, you know, were rhetorically leftist because that's not where the party is. And it's almost like kind of, OK, at least we know how marginal marginal they treat us and how much of a fight these things are going to be like. Yeah, and, to, it, and to be fair, they're not even talking about the policies they do embrace. Right. I mean, like the 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 DNC has made the calculation and I I. I it's hard to argue uh, that making the argument that Joe Biden is a man of integrity, he's a good guy who cares about you, and that the Democratic Party is inclusive is going to be the message that's going to resonate more than any specific issues, right? I mean, it's not like they're pushing, like, it's not like they're going, like, you know, doing uh, a 20 minute speech about the um, earned income tax credits they're going to give. <laughs> yeah. Mean, you know, it's not like they're not pushing any policy. It's not just that they're not pushing right. progressive policy, they're not pushing any policy. And they, the only that, policy that has like buy in on a popular level is progressive policy right now. Yes. And they're just, they're, they're, they are making a greeting card that just has a sentiment that they think is going to move people. And frankly, I think there's probably a decent amount of data out there that would say like, yeah, when you, when, you know, you have, you know, in terms of who they're trying to reach, 
which is usually a second order thing, like how it gets reported. They are the way that they will reach these people. If there's any of those people out there to be reached, and maybe there isn't is to, uh, you know, do these like sort of platitudes on some level. Now, the only, the only, the only counter argument is, well, if you do, if you talk about material things, what you'll probably do is motivate a certain segment of your base to go out and be more enthusiastic. And I think their calculation is, is like, well, there's only so much that people can do anyways in the context of a, <laughs> of a coronavirus and that maybe the coronavirus is doing some of that work too. Maybe the question is, is like, we don't need to explain to people the urgency of the moment. We just need to basically say that Joe Biden's a guy who cares about it and is going to do something about it. I don't know. That's a, that's a hard thing to argue with. I don't particularly like it, but it's a hard thing to say yeah. is completely irrational on a, just a sheer, you know, get in office. I mean, really, I think now that the key is for the left to be, um, you know, contemplating what, uh, what the asks are going to be and when they're going to be made uh, after uh, the election, where the legislative pushes are going to happen and how people are going to organize and building, you know, um, uh, relationships and, and institutions uh, that are going to be activated when these legislative fights start happening. Mm -hmm. And there's going to have to be priorities and there's going to have to be things that like, you know, uh, horse trading and people are going to have to have on some level an understanding of that and still maintain the uh, urgency for change. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Yep. We need to do all of that and be participating in the next rebellion when it happens so that each rebellion becomes more organized, more terrible, more fearsome. And maybe someday we get the whole enchilada. Yep. Uh, I, I mean, I would be surprised if we don't see something like, uh, like, uh, you know, I mean, you know, BLM, uh, Occupy, all born during the um, um, Obama era. I would be surprised if we don't see more uh, of that and it grow. All right, here's just uh, one more clip of Donald Trump. This is the second day in a row that Donald Trump has said this. Donald Trump goes out there. If he gets a decent response, if he enjoys saying something, he says it. Um, he is saying this to get people, you know, riled, riled up. But I just don't think it has the same impact as like, you know, his owning the libs stuff got back in the day. Here's Donald Trump. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I, I should have uh, extra time. Now, it's unfortunate because, and we didn't go through this, but the Senate Intelligence Committee, chaired by a Republican, issued a report that basically said Paul Manafort was working with a Russian spy who Manafort had reason to believe was a Russian spy Transcripts have shown that Manafort certainly thought that he was a conduit to the Russian government. The, the Senate Intel Committee also said there is reason to believe that this Russian spy, Kalimnik, was involved uh, in the hack and leak of the stuff that came from uh, the uh, Clinton servers, the DNC servers, that Trump lied about his contacts with Stone and, con and Stone's contacts with WikiLeaks in terms of, of dropping this information. Um, the Senate Intel report went even further than Mueller on a lot of this stuff. Did they use the word collusion? No, because that word is meaningless. I don't know. Did, did, did Jamie and I, did, did, we, did we have any contact on you showing up on the program today? Mm, no, we did not text each other. I did not mm -hmm. say come on the show today, but Brendan, uh, make sure that you're on the line. Right. So it goes from like, Brendan, did I say to you, make sure that Jamie's on the line today? No, because Brendan knows that I want to make sure that Jamie's here. That is not collusion, but it is certainly my agenda being carried out because people know what's expected of them. And there's mm -hmm. a tit for a tat. Jamie doesn't say, Sam, can I have my, you know, payroll this week? Because I pay Jamie because I know that's her expectation. She knows my expectation. I would hope so. Right. I mean, it, there you go. It is fun for me to think of it as collusion, though. Well, OK, but there you go. But there it is. So that is the dynamic that, that you've got uh, Donald Trump soliciting this stuff in some instances publicly, in some instances privately and this stuff coming. And so is it collusion? No, but Paul Manafort, certainly. But so, you know, all these uh, uh, now 
I never thought that it went necessarily as deep as this. I thought it was just they were more or less blind as to who the people they were working with. And I think there's still an element of that. But I will say this right now. I am not expecting an apology from the a-holes who, look, were there people uh, in certain parts of the media who were hyperbolic about it? Yes, just like everything else. But I'm not expecting apologies from the a-holes who made a big stink about the fact that I said, you know, the, I, I, I stated a, uh, a report from the Senate Intel Committee. If you want to give me an apology, I'll accept it. But I'm not, I'm not demanding one. And I'm not saying that they have to apologize to their people for spreading the BS because they thought it was convenient. I never said that Donald Trump uh, won because of this, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. So concerned about the truth. Anyways, I love how salty you are about this. Well, it's just, it's just like, you know, I, the, the part that I hate about it is the preening and the sort of like, I'm a truth teller and you're just caught up in this and that. And then in fact, actually, well, a truth teller, except for the, some of the, some of the stuff I was saying was wrong, but I'm a truth teller. Let me give me a break. Everybody's just the posturing. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so Donald Trump, uh, meanwhile, likes getting under the uh, lib skins. And uh, here he is. Two days in a row, he's found a laugh line on his uh, his really anemic um, uh, tour. Here is uh, Wisconsin and Yuma, Arizona. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you know, considering that we caught President Obama and Sleepy Joe Biden spying on our campaign, treason, we'll probably be entitled to another four more years after that. Mm. No backsies. Wait, I thought it was, wasn't it slow Joe Biden or are they gone back to sleepy Joe Biden? Uh, I think they're using it interchangeably. We're going to go for eight more years. He's, uh, that's just his oh, way boy. of like getting under people's skin a little bit, I think. Does, doesn't he also literally say do over in the later part of this clip? Because I think that's pretty funny. Oh, that was the, that was the other one. This was in Yuma. That's what he did in Wisconsin. This is like I say, he did it two days in a row. Here it is. We are going to win four more years. And then after that, we'll check. go for another four years because... You know what? They spied on my campaign. We should get a redo of four years. A redo. Oh, wow. There you go. Yeah, he also called same seats when he left. <laughs> That's right. No gives these backsies. Um, all right, I'm hanging up uh, on the phone. We're not going to have time for phone. But you know what? I want to do that, that Sager clip. Is that all right, guys? We do just like, a, I'll do it. I'll do it quick. Okay. Because, because this gets to both like, you know, Look. Yeah, no, I hate this guy. Do it. Well, it's not so much that, um, I mean, what he's saying here, I'm going to do the same thing he did, okay? I'm going to critique it, but then I'm also going to say it's mostly uh, somewhat accurate, but but the, the, the tonally, it's a little bit wrong and this and that. And that's basically what we're looking at here. Play this clip. It's unfortunate that they tried to build it as Russiagate 2 because on the day... Um, that the Senate Intel report comes out, which confirmed a lot of stuff like, you know, uh, the first time we had Mercy Wheeler on, we had her on three or four times over the course of a couple of years talking about this. She was always very skeptical of the Steele dossier. In fact, said years ago that she felt that it was uh, specifically put out as Russian disinformation, almost like a uh, rat F. And that's apparently what the Senate Intel Committee, chaired by a Republican, also found. Um, deep, deep state. I'm not going to believe, I'm not going to believe in the deep state Republican chairman of this committee. I'm going to believe in Donald Trump. He's much more believable. All right. So, um, but here is, uh, but this is a piece on the post office and this whole, like this, 
there is something that we used to call a slate pitch, which was contrarianism for the sake of contrarianism. And there's a little bit of that happening here. But before you do that, you got to find, you got to create a little bit of, 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 of straw men. Now, I, everybody, the, the point is that like, when you start to like slice things like this, what you're doing, there's a certain amount of marketing and positioning that you're doing here. So let's watch this. All right, Tiger, what's on your radar? Well, I'm here to tell you all the tale of an unhinged conspiracy theory. Born Pause on the it for internet one second. We should just the... tell you that we're speeding it up because I want to go through the first couple of minutes. Go ahead. Media hammered relentlessly on MSNBC, born in part by Trump's ineptitude and incompetence, and which reveals an enduring truth about a rock-solid ideology held within the Republican Party. No, I'm not talking about Russiagate. I'm talking here about the post office. And I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on within that agency and the depress depressing truths that it tells you about our media and our political leaders of both parties. Nobody is being spared here. The theory goes something like this. Trump and his postmaster general, who is a longtime Republican donor, are destroying the United States Postal Service to make it harder for people to vote by mail in the 2020 election. If you believe this, I genuinely don't blame you. The mainstream okay, media and the Democratic Party have done it. Now, now, he defines the theory as Trump and the Postmaster General are, um, are conspiring to make it harder to vote by mail. Now, we've here been saying that it's been a twofer, right? People keep saying or hearing me say twofer. They want to destroy the, uh, they have a long-term agenda to destroy the post office. They want to privatize it. And Trump is uh, enjoying it because he wants to make sure that there's no vote by mail. And of course, Trump has actually got a, like a, almost like a, 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 a second, you know, a point, point one version of that agenda, which is I want to make the potential result of the election um, questionable. So I can both like prevent vote by mail and also disparage it. Go ahead. A horrific disservice to the American people by essentially sowing doubt about the results of the 2020 election, when in fact, rank incompetence and ideology by Trump are a much easier answer. So let's go down the list of claims and we'll get the facts. I'll pause it for one second. I'm, I'm relying sorry. heavily so here. What, what are you saying here is he's saying here that it's problematic that people are calling, uh, are saying that there's a problem with this, with, with complaining about the post office for doing this, because that creates a sense of insecurity about the election. So he's now saying that talking about the post office as if it's under attack to uh, undermine the ability to vote by mail is problematic because it undermines people's faith in the election. That's what he's saying is happening. Answer. So let's go down the list of claims and we'll get the facts about each one. I'm relying heavily here for this monologue on a fantastic media piece. It was written by Nick Harper. He's a nonprofit staffer who apparently is a better journalist than every other major national political reporter. Now, my personal favorite part about this conspiracy theory are the ones which supposedly have the most evidence. So the U.S. Postal Service, they say, is intentionally removing post office boxes off American streets and in some cases are even locking them up to prevent people from putting in their mail. Evidence for these claims, it's in viral claims on Twitter, like this one from Thomas Kennedy. Dramatically shows a stack of post office boxes dramatically stacked together. It was retweeted 82,000 times. Or this one from Rex Chapman showing red locks on postal service boxes in Burbank, California. The dramatic image was retweeted 20,000 times. Or this one from Senator Claire McCaskill in which she shared a photo of a mailbox in D.C. with a lock on it. There's just one problem, however, that viral stack of mailboxes. Yeah, those have been there for years, and it was taken at a warehouse where they refurbish old post office boxes. <laughs> those lock boxes in Burbank, California, that photo's from 2016. And actually, those locks are meant to allow only one letter to be dropped in at a time to discourage mail theft. My personal favorite, Claire McCaskill's photo of a mailbox from D.C.? Well, it's from Capitol Hill. And by that, I mean Capitol Hill in Seattle, Washington. So once again, that device is also meant to discourage theft, not to actually render the machines functionless. I don't want to dunk too much, though. It is true that as a cost-cutting measure, the post office was removing some boxes off the street, mostly to reduce the hours worked by members of the post pause office okay. and answer the so, outcry so, that was spurred so on by it, false information. So the biggest piece of evidence that he highlights for this claim are some dude, Thomas Kennedy, I don't know who that is, some other dude, Rex Chackman, who this is, and Claire McCaskill, who literally no one listens to. Yes, she gets on MSNBC, and she tweeted out this thing about the post office. Now, now, the post office boxes are the weakest piece of evidence of the theory that he propagates that I'm not even sure that everybody is propagating. But, but that's the weakest piece of evidence. One, so much so that when I saw that report about in Portland, I didn't even report it because 
I think that's probably pretty common and that mail carrier that we just had on the phone uh, also indicated it. The first time I saw the Rex Chapman tweet, it was somebody debunking it. And I think that's what most of those retweets were actually. Who is Rex Chapman and who is Thomas it, Kennedy? I'm not sure who Rex Chapman is. He's a big account on Twitter. He looks like some clout chaser that like posts a lot of leftist content now, but okay. I don't know. Because who he's just like... oh. Did we lose Sam? What happened? Oh, no. Oh, he was just going in for the kill on this post office stuff. Oh, no. Right on his last. Uh... Oh, shoot. Um, I don't know if we can get him back. Let's God, he, he's got to be so mad right now. Um, <laughs> um, well, folks, I don't know. We might have to just call it a show. I am giving it. I'm, I just reached out to him. We'll see if we can uh, get him back quickly. Yeah. Mm. Um, he might still that be is... going. Everyone's got post office blue balls now. They need to know. <laughs> they Red need to know the punchline. <laughs> Um, he oh, got yeah, dropped, he's gone he now. Said. No. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Well. Let's see if you can reconnect here. Um, I might. Oh, my video's not working now for some reason. Uh oh. Um, oh, here we go. <laughs> well, this hasn't happened the entire Zoom experience mm. until this. Until we bring Final up the before. first kill clip that we play. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, maybe some might have to spend some of our vacation looking into who funds the hill. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. we'll I wonder. Uh, should we, uh, what should we do, guys? Should Sam we... says uh, we should continue to have this conversation. He wants to finish. He wants to wrap this up. It'll okay, be a so little, like, little bit like more work in post, but, you know. It'll be like he's, he's coming back to do it or? Yes. Uh... yes. Okay, let's see, no, uh, let's see here. I'll let you know. <laughs> like right now? Yeah. As soon as he can. Um, uh, okay. Do, 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 Well, I guess I'll just share something that's semi-relevant while we wait for Sam to, uh, <laughs> Sam to wants me to send him a, f- a phone number to call. <laughs> he has no internet. Um, oh, okay. no. Um, okay. Rural broadband, man. Um, okay, one second. <laughs> Wait, is he is he back in the city? That makes sense too. My internet no, sucks, and I- he's not. I don't think. No. Um, well, here is a video from Heather Walker. Uh, while Sam tries to call in, uh, she's an anchor and investigative reporter at Wood TV. Looks like the Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, news uh station there and here's her uh i guess we got russia get 2.1 if <laughs> if this is russia get 2.0 here's some reporting she's doing everyone had to walk with with tv we're at the usps patterson location where behind me you can see a graveyard of mail sorting pieces they're just large pieces of machinery that have been yanked out you can see some of the cords are just there you go, they were just cut. In addition to that, there's also a dumpster right there. And according to an employee that works across the way, they tell me that that dumpster has been filled three times since last week with parts and pieces of what we're being told are the mail sorting machines. We'll have more updates for you coming up tonight at five and six on Wood TV. There you go. So not tweets. Um, Is that real? Yeah, I think that's real. I don't know uh, who to believe now. Oh, here he is. Okay. Sam has to finish the segment so I know who to believe. Um, I think we got him, hopefully. Okay, Sam, can you see him? We cannot see you yet, but we can hear you. All right, folks, I'm sorry. So, the um, what about, can you see me now? No, we can't. You can, we can hear you though. Okay. So, all right. Um, uh, let's, okay. Yeah. So, um, where was I? Oh, so uh, Claire McCaskill, nobody listened to Claire McCaskill. Nobody knows who Thomas Kennedy is. Nobody goes who Rick Cha- Chapman is. Um, and that's the basis of saying that this is a wild conspiracy theory. Go ahead. 
cutting measure, the post office was removing some boxes off the street, mostly to reduce the hours worked by members of the post office and answer the outcry that was spurred on by false information about the office. And the post office ultimately came out and said, it will pause the practice completely. The next claim is that a new postmaster general is a Republican donor handpicked by Trump who assumed office two months ago with the sole purpose of destroying mail-in ballots for the election. Except there's a problem there. Trump does not have a say in who the postmaster general is. The postmaster general is selected by an independent board of governors, of which currently consists of three Republicans, a Democrat, who are unanimously, unanimously selected him in May because he spent 35 years as the head of a logistics company, something that pertains Pause to the it for one office. second. Pause it for one second. Pause it for one second. Pause it one second. And again, folks, I apologize. I, I lost my internet, and so I'm only here for audio. Okay, look, the next claim isn't that he was brought in exclusively for that purpose. There's a hostility towards the post office. The guy has a, a financial interest in Amazon. He has a financial interest in all of these uh, entities that are uh, would, would win if the post office is uh, privatized. Um, and so that's not the narrowness of the claim, but the idea that this independent board that is dominated by Republicans just came upon this guy because he's good at logistics <laughs> and not because he's contributed um, millions of dollars to, uh, to Republicans, not just the president, but to others. The guy that that is just a total coincidence is just absurd. I mean, give me a break. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, but continue. Similarly, sounds alarming until you dig into it, that the post office is destroying mail sorting machines, which are the same ones used to sort mail in ballots. Well, that is interesting because the order to dismantle some of the mail machines went out on May 15th. And before this, the new postmaster general was even in charge. But as Nick Harper notes, the type of mail that these machines are sorting are decreasing in volume from last year. And it fits with the numerous documents that have been published by the government since 2012 in order to make the post office more efficient. Which brings us to the last and final claim, which some of you right, probably shouting right your screen. Pause it right there. Pause it right. Pause it right there. Now, sure. the bottom line is like our government has plans to invade Canada. All right. The idea that because these plans existed, these plans existed from 2018 when Steve Mnuchin was basically putting together a, um, uh, a sat was in a committee to figure out how to essentially privatize the um, the post office. The fact that this guy was brought in to do it doesn't, and that the plans to some extent, like he said, some extent existed, that's not dispositive of anything. That's not dispositive of anything. Continue. Right now, Sagar, you're an idiot. Trump himself already admitted to all of this in a recent interview. He straight up said he doesn't want to fund the post office because Democrats want to expand mail-in balloting. You're probably yelling, he admitted to it. And you know what? I don't blame you for thinking that because just like with Russiagate, Trump is his own worst enemy. But the truth is, is that as much as it may appear that Trump does not mind the idea of screwing with the post office to make it harder for people to vote by mail, that there's no evidence that anything like that is actually happening. The truth instead is that despite Trump's nefarious intentions here, is that what has happened instead is the culmination of years of problems with the post office, some self-inflicted, some imposed by budgetary constraints, which were engineered by Republican lawmakers who have long hated the post office and want to privatize it. The slow in service that has come about, as Nick Harper puts it, is, quote, there are changes happening to our postal system because it's been needed for a long time. And USPS cannot wait any longer to make cost-saving changes pause it. without becoming... Pause it, pause it, pause it, pause it, pause it. Pause it. Pause it. First off, they can wait longer. They could get a, a, a bailout. The fact of the matter is, is that Donald Trump, and just like in Russiagate, he may be his own worst enemy, but go read the Senate Intel report. Part of the reason why there's Russiagate is because his campaign manager was feeding information but in both directions uh, with a Russian spy, Kalimnik. Part of it was also that he was, he was in constant contact with Roger Stone, who was do, who was basically the agent of the president in the way that he was functioning, was coordinating the drops of this material when um, coordinating the drops of this material when um, uh, uh, you know uh, when it was most beneficial for their campaign, like when the um, the uh, when the uh, the uh, grabbing by the the p word uh, uh, tape dropped. And then, like, the idea that Trump can't be incompetent and can't just, like, if this was going on 
and there was a president who didn't want to slow down vote by mail, they would be reacting very differently to what the postmaster general is doing than what Donald Trump is doing. So none of this is dispositive whatsoever of, 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 of what's going on. Is there a hyperbole? Do some people have it wrong that the post office boxes themselves? But we also have, oh, you can't see me, so I don't need to uh, hold this where I'm holding it. But we also have um, 40 states that are suing the post office because they have been told by the post office, we cannot process your mail-in ballots. That to me seems like a pretty big piece of evidence that they're attempting to inhibit mail-in voting. Now, I don't think that the post office can't handle these mail-in ballots, but we do know it is a fact. It is a fact. Um, 21 states are, are, are suing, and the post office has told over 40 states that we can't handle it. Now, just the fact of telling a state that we can't handle it, whether it's true or not, inhibits their vote by mail. So yes, people's hair should be on fire about this. You're not telling the truth because you think there's some uh, three or four websites or, or, or Twitter feeds are being hyperbolic about this. That's absurd. It's absurd. Mm -hmm. And so that's my uh, take on this. People should be concerned about it. Look at this. The uh, Alaska, Alaska.com, I'm not sure which uh, paper out there. In a nationwide rule change that went unnoticed this summer, the U.S. Postal Service has forbidden employees from signing absentee ballots as witnesses while on duty. The change could make it more difficult for Alaskans, particularly rural residents, to vote by mail. Now, that may hurt Donald Trump in the long run, but if you want to talk about Donald Trump's incompetence, say his incompetence uh, is that he doesn't know how to manipulate the system to benefit him. He thinks it's going to benefit uh, the Democrats to have vote by mail. And it very well may. They may not be concerned about rural Alaskans, but maybe they're concerned about, I don't know, other states. So the bottom line is that that nonprofit guy on Medium, who seems like a decent fellow, worked a uh, lawyer for the League of Women Voters, didn't have this story from uh, Alaska.com, didn't know that the Postal Service has forbidden employees from signing absentee ballots, didn't mention anything about the lawsuit by 21 states across the country, didn't mention anything about the 40 states that have been formed by the Postal Service that they can't handle their, their ballots, whether it's true or not. I mean, so... That's not the full story. They're not just truth tellers. They're tainting it with their perspective as well. Is there hyperbole? Yes. Welcome to America News. Whether it's so, online, whether it's on TV, wherever. Yeah. yeah. And he seems to be implying throughout that it can't possibly be political because the Democrats were complicit in some of these attacks on the post office, as if the Democrats have never done anything that undermines their own power in ways they couldn't predict. Right. And there may be some, uh, you know, there's there certainly may be some members of the Democratic Party who get maybe some of their funding from FedEx or UPS or, or whatever it is. Um, Can I just say also on the Russiagate 2.0 framing of this, like with Russiagate, even if we could argue about the severity of it, there's a straightforward geopolitical argument to the stakes there. What are the, what are we, what are we risking being too vigilant about plans to like box up the post office? Like, I, I don't understand. I mean, I think it's all, I mean, I know what it is. It's because they want to emphasize leftist overreaction to any kind of reactionary uh, act, act of power. That's, that's all this game is about. Yeah. 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 It and the tampering is much more material and easy to see in this case, right? Like Russiagate, you're not like literally going in and tampering with the machines that they use to do the vote with. Like it was much more diffuse and, you know, a lot of social media online stuff. This is going to be a lot harder to argue against, I think. Yes, I think so. And, and the bottom line is, is that if you did not have a president who was rightly or wrongly in terms of whether it benefits him against vote by mail. And I think there's an argument that he's actually shooting himself in the foot, but that's his agenda. And his reaction 
to what this postmaster general, who is not so independently picked, I'm sorry, um, is not, you know, because it's in his best interest if he wants to privatize the post office and the Republican Party to keep Donald Trump in office, incidentally. Um, just because his agenda doesn't, uh, you know, it may be uh, contrary to his own actual benefit, doesn't mean that he wouldn't react differently if he really wanted to allow vote by mail to happening when the postmaster general, supposedly independent, is doing these things. I'm sorry. It's just like, it's just a poor argument. And it really is just all you're doing is, um, is being concerned with like, I don't know, the, 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 the performative aspects of this rather than the substance. The substance is real. I'm sorry, it's real. Um, and uh, whether the story, you know, it's also very difficult to get the specifics of every story uh, clear when people are working so desperately hard to, 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 to in, involved in subterfuge, right? Like Russia Gate even with this Senate Intel report would look a lot worse if, um, if we didn't have people who were lying to all these committees and to these in 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 investigators. All right, well, folks, uh, I've lost my internet service. So uh, thanks for indulging us. Um, Jamie and uh, et al. will be here tomorrow with a, a Michael homage. Uh, Nomi will be here on Thursday. I mean, on Friday, rather. Check out her show today at 3 p.m. Bye bye. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. See the truth in the light bar Finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my power